Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this special meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order, uh, Monday, August 22nd, 2022. Uh, our meeting tonight is, as, as I said, a special meeting, and it, it's basically, if you recall, our good old-fashioned study sessions. This is an opportunity for us to receive input from staff, just to, to gather information. It's the only item we have on the agenda with the exception of uh, our city council updates. Uh, but beyond that, we're just here to learn more about uh, the budget discussion. We're going to have a budget discussion as we head into headlong into budget season here. So welcome to everybody. Welcome to everybody who's watching at home. Thanks for being with us. Uh, our one and only item on the agenda, I will call item 2.1, our 2023 preliminary tax levy and general fund budget discussion. We've got Kari Carlson, our budget manager, and Mr. Verbrugge down in front of us here. And I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank Good evening. you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. And tonight is our discussion. We want to share information about the 2023 budget and um, get your guidance and direction. So, Kari, if I could ask you just yes. to get a little closer to the microphone. Yes. So. Can you hear me better? Much better. There. Okay, sorry. So, uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, so, tonight we have some information about the 2023 budget to share with you um, for the preliminary tax levy and budget that will be set um, next month. Oops, there we go. So this is um, how we've categorized it. So first, um, the city manager is going to give some information on how kind of the theme of this budget request is public safety. Um, a lot of the increase that is in this budget from last year is for police and fire. And um, then I'm going to share with you what we've been doing as far as public engagement, um, getting feedback from the community about city spending. We'll talk about um, how our approach to this budget is aligned with our community-based strategic planning uh, plan, Bloomington Tomorrow Together. And then we'll get um, going to the 2023 working budget models, uh, where, where we are right now, and then go over some dates that are left on this year's budget calendar. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Rodrigue. Thank you, Kari. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to hit on uh, at the very beginning here on what is the prime emphasis of our budget for 2023, and that's public safety. Uh, this budget is very much uh, focused on uh, making strategic investments in public safety for the coming year and not just the coming year, but I would say uh, for many years into the future. Uh, as council is aware, but for the benefit of those who may be watching, uh, we have been looking at our uh, fire department staffing model for several years now. We had an assessment that was done uh, as part of our ongoing series of uh, uh, service assessments uh, to evaluate the, the fire department back in 2019, Chief, was 20, uh, 20, 20, actually 2018 yeah, right. when the assessment was done, but 2019. Thank you. Yep, 2019 is when the results came uh, forward. And uh, what became uh, evident in that study is what's being addressed today. And that is that a uh, city of the size and complexity of Bloomington uh, can really no longer expect to operate well with a paid on call um, fire department staffing model. And that is not at all uh, an indication or a criticism of the work that our firefighters do. It is uh, the fact that we have outgrown the, the, the uh, part-time, what used to be referred to as volunteers. They are no longer volunteers. We've been paying them for many years, um, but they are, they are uh, paid on call firefighters. So we pay them when they respond to a call. We also staff uh, fire stations with duty crews. So uh, at least during some hours of the day, we have uh, anticipated and regular staffing. But even with that, uh, we're still encountering many challenges. And one of the greatest challenges that we encounter is, uh, frankly, recruitment and retention. Uh, we're a department that has an authorized strength uh, of um, 155 is the ideal number. And in your on the slide here, you see that we're at 111, and the chief just updated me. We're actually at 108. So just in the time since uh, the presentation was put together, we've lost three more firefighters. 
And so the ability to recruit is, is becoming a challenge, and there are many reasons for that, uh, many of which have been reviewed with the council in the past. Uh, but uh, people's lifestyles have changed. Uh, there's less permanence living in community. Uh, there are more demands on people's time, and so trying to find people who have the lifestyle and flexibility uh, to serve as part-time firefighters uh, is, is challenging. And so we've talked about transitioning to a full-time staffing model. Uh, and we have 10 new fire positions in the budget between 2022 and 2023. Um, we'll, you know, we'll mostly refer to 2023. Kari and I will refer to it as the working model as we go through here because I don't want anybody to assume that when I say they're in the budget that they are already decided to be in the budget. So just so we're clear about that up front. Um, the, the council approved the addition of four firefighters this year. Uh, and then the six that are included for next year. Uh, ultimately, our goal is to get to a staffing model where we have about 75 paid or permanent uh, full-time firefighters and 60 paid on-call firefighters. Uh, where we'll get into the fire budget a little bit later here again, but the um, the the cost for operating next year will include both the hiring of the full-time firefighters but also continued hiring of uh, paid on call firefighters uh, because we do need to maintain that um, balance and uh, we have a very senior um, firefighter uh, cadre that is becoming less senior every day so Kari, if you go to the next slide actually this sort of illustrates the point uh, when we're looking at what is the measurement of whether our fire department is meeting uh, yours and our expectation for how we deliver service, uh, you'll see here uh, as a percentage of total calls, um, the ones that are meeting total response time, uh, that's been hovering in the 63 to 64 range for most of 2022. But then if you look down uh, a little bit further, um, there's there are two numbers uh, that are concerning. One is when our apparatus are rolling with only one or two firefighters. And in May and June, uh, that number was, uh, I would say, unacceptably high, right? And so uh, I wanna assure people that all calls are being responded to. Uh, we have command staff that are always gonna get there, but the ability to start setting up the um, fire ground and, and getting hoses pulled and everything else is complicated when we're only sending out one or two on a rig. And then when you see the all rookie crew, uh, 56 times in the month of June, uh, we rolled an all-rookie crew. Now, that's that's not, a, again, a bad thing. It's not a criticism of the firefighters, uh, but I think all of you appreciate that there's a certain amount of ex uh, experience that uh, is necessary to effectively set up and, and combat a fire. And so it's not an ideal situation when you have uh, relatively young crews who are responding. So uh, based on the national um, benchmarks, uh, uh, sorry, I moved on to the police. So just uh, summarizing the fire, um, like I said, we're going to try to move to 75 full-time, 60 paid on call, and that's over the next 10 years. So uh, 2023 is continuing what we have been discussing uh, in, the, in the last several years. So what are residents going to see in terms of uh, how this makes a difference for them? Uh, again, that percentage of uh, calls that are arriving within that, within that anticipated response time uh, is a big measure of our success. Uh, the chief will tell you that uh, every minute at a fire uh, is critical, uh, that fires can as much as double within a minute's time. And so every minute that we lose responding um, puts somebody's property and, and perhaps their life at risk. So adding the uh, fire response capacity is going to uh, increase our response time. Uh, it also gives us more predictability in our staffing uh, so that we don't have this situation of rolling light is what we call that um, when we don't have as many firefighters on apparatus as we'd like to have. Moving on to, just, yep, just ask, would you like us to hold questions until the end, or, or do you want us to ask as we go along? Um, why don't we have questions for clarity as we go? Okay. Um, and then if we're going to get into a little bit more uh, uh, issue specific or department specific questions for um, directors or chiefs, we'll we'll save those for the end. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Everybody good with that? Yep. All right. Thank okay. You. Cool. Thanks, Mayor. All right. In police, we're also making. Uh, 
uh, investments that we haven't made, frankly, in quite a while. Uh, our department, um, other than adding staff, so this sounds like a funny thing to say, but I'm going to say it. Other than adding five police officers in 2016, we haven't, we haven't really added staffing capacity in the police department since 2008. So why do I say other than those five? Back in 2015, there was a credible threat made against the Mall of America, and there was a conscientious decision that was made uh, to increase our South Loop um, police presence uh, to make sure that those types of events were th uh, avoided as much as possible. Those positions are paid for from the South Loop Development Fund. So the number of police officers that are patrolling the other parts of Bloomington have, have not, the number has not changed since 2008. Uh, our community just within the last 10 years has grown by nearly 10,000 people. And like uh, all of you know, this is a city that has more complexity than uh, most suburbs. And uh, frankly, the uh, sophistication that's required of our police department and the work that they do uh, is uh, on a level and complexity that is greater than most other cities. So um, at this point in time, I think it's pretty clear, and the chief uh, will tell you as well, that uh, it's, it's time to review our staffing complement and start making investments there. And again, the question is, so what, is, what difference is this going to make for our residents? Uh, I think one of the most significant differences that it will make is it's going to increase the, uh, frankly, the effectiveness of our police officers. It's certainly going to affect their, um, uh, their working conditions and their morale. And I say that for this reason. Uh, we have what I will call frictional vacancy within the department every year that is somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 10 to 12 officers. So we have to make up for those um, officers by working a lot of overtime. Uh, within the last couple of years, for the first time that anybody can remember around here, uh, we have um, had a tough time getting our officers to sign up for what we call contract overtime, which is generally perceived by them as being a good thing because they're working so much regular overtime just to cover our patrol uh, needs. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing that COT is, is being farmed out to other cities. That's, that's not the issue. The indicator here is how much our police officers are having to work above and beyond at, at the patrol activity that is frankly the most stressful for them. And so the more that that pressure is put on our police officers, the less effective over time they are becoming. And what we want to make sure we do is have police officers who are fully capable of doing the job, and that means that they got to be working a reasonable number of hours. The, the demands of overtime on our officers is, um, frankly, been for the last several years uh, more than what they can handle. Right? Again, not a criticism of the police officers. It's just stating a fact here that uh, we have certain numbers of shifts that we have to provide, and we're not uh, able to do that without really relying on officers to work a lot of hours above and beyond. Uh, so I think that that will uh, lead to more, um, uh, more engaged, more uh, refreshed, and, and frankly, more energized police officers doing more work that we've seen recently that they're starting to do more proactive work. These are the things that people expect in their community. So uh, paying attention to neighborhoods, making sure that uh, proactive traffic stops are being done. That's the type of um, neighborhood focused and, and community focused work that we want our police officers to be doing. Uh, and I, I think adding officers is going to allow us to do that. Uh, the request has two police officers and then also one position in our dispatch that would essentially be a quality control person. Uh, Council is aware because we did an assessment of our dispatch services as well that we have been challenged uh, in the dispatch area for the last several years again with this issue of um, vacancies putting a lot of pressure on our dispatch operations. Uh, we are getting closer to uh, being uh, at, at a staffing level that is functional and uh, providing uh, more direction and opportunity through them through the dispatch supervisor and this new dispatch position uh, is going to improve, frankly, the, the work that they do in the dispatch uh, center as well. So it's, uh, in our mind, a, a long overdue investment in adding officers for the benefit to the whole community. So when you put uh, police and public safety together, uh, and, and that's just the, the numbers of bodies, 
Um, we have investments beyond personnel in public safety, and the reason I say that this is a public safety first budget is that uh, the the working budget right now is going up almost four and a half million dollars to accommodate um, these requests for public safety. So it's the four firefighters from 2022 and the six additional firefighters for next year. We have a new fire station that is uh, under construction right now, so we have the debt service for that project of about $880,000 a year that will come on the general tax levy. Uh, the, the fire stations, as council is aware again, and we've been sharing with the community for the last five, six years as we've talked about our capital project needs into the future, um, our fire stations are of a certain age uh, that they are becoming close to functionally obsolete, uh, not because of anything that's wrong with the buildings per se, but the, the industry of fighting fires has changed. And so the apparatus is much bigger. Um, the, the apparatus that we use is growing, and so uh, the stations do not have um, functional space in them also as we transition to a full-time staffing model, none of our fire stations have adequate housing uh, accommodations in them so that uh, officers will have, uh, frankly, or firefighters will have uh, places to uh, sleep. And so we're putting living quarters in all of our fire stations. Uh, fire station number three on the east side uh, at 86th was the uh, first of the new fire stations completed a couple years ago. Fire station number four is under um, construction right now. We have four more fire stations within the next decade that are in need of replacement. Uh, we have additional training equipment, service, and supplies that go with new firefighters, but also just uh, standard replacement in the schedule. And so you see uh, there's about six, $725,000 uh, in the request for those types of uh, um, uh, support for the firefighters as well as half a million dollars in large equipment purchases. On the police side, uh, in addition to the, the three additional um, police positions, uh, we have the police body cams and software for 2023. Uh, this number is going up significantly. As the council will recall, we, we uh, uh, got into the body camera uh, business about three years ago. We did a thorough vetting of the vendors. Uh, there were three of them that we worked uh, diligently to understand their process and the, and the packages that they provided uh, and the functionality. Uh, we chose Axon. Uh, in the first uh, several years of that contract, those services were delivered for $100,000. As we have uh, continued to look at uh, our needs and, and what the uh, vendor provides, uh, we have added uh, capability and the cost has gone up. So the contract for the next several years is anticipated to be in the neighborhood of $540,000 a year. Uh, the body cameras and, and the supporting software are, are frankly an expectation of how we do police work that I think most in the community will agree we're not going backwards on. Uh, the, the level of expectation around transparency uh, in how our police do our work, but also the level of expectation for how we protect our police officers and the body cams provide that opportunity uh, for uh, the officers uh, to not be uh, wrongly accused of, of uh, misbehavior also. So it's a two-way street. Um, one of the indicators I want to provide here um, is that the amount of data that's being created now is so far beyond what, what it was five years ago um, that it is frankly challenging our operations. Um, so four or five years ago, we were processing about 5,000 uh, pieces of digital data, of evidence. Okay? Next year, we're expecting that number to be over 25,000. So just in, in the five-year time frame, about a 500% uh, increase in the amount of evidence, uh, digital evidence that's being managed. Uh, so uh, the cameras, the software, and the staffing that's necessary to do that work uh, is a significant investment, and, and frankly, that's just an expectation for how we do our work that's, that's not changing. 
And then finally, we have another $300,000 of increased um, training and equipment uh, expense within the police department for 2023. So when we look at that, I think what we're doing is first and foremost responding to concern in the community. Uh, as, as there is in the community beyond Bloomington, uh, public safety is at the top of mind for uh, many residents in uh, Minnesota. We wanna make sure that we are being responsive to those concerns. Secondly, uh, we recognize that Bloomington is a city of a certain age, that we've outgrown the staffing models that we've had in the past and have served us well for many years. But as we think about how we deliver those services in the future and need to be strategic about how we pivot to doing that, uh, we are starting that process here. And so it's a multi-year process. This isn't a one-year process. Excuse me, Mr. Brewer, mm -hmm. Council Member Carter, question of clarity. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the increase in the capabilities. You talked about, obviously, the dramatic increase in data, mm -hmm. uh, but you didn't totally, you didn't explicitly connect the two, I guess. And so obviously this is a huge increase it is. in capabilities. And so could you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily... Uh, equate the increase in the cost for the body cameras as increased capability. Uh, frankly, it's a market-driven vendor increased cost. Uh, and we are having to bear that cost because we've, we really don't have anywhere else to go unless we want to go back out and look at other vendors and then completely unwind the systems that we already have in place. So that's the, that's the biggest challenge to us uh, from trying to find a cost competitive alternative at this point in time is much of what we do is already um, deeply connected with the Axon system. Thank you. So also what you're saying then is that we are kind of not, I don't want to say stuck with this system for a while, but it kind of sounds like, I mean, this is the system we have. And if at any point we want to switch, that's going to be a big. It will be a big shift. Okay. Yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Manderstein, something to add? Go ahead. Uh, Mayor members, uh, so we have built uh, integrations uh, into our databases and into our existing case management systems and software that uh, link, uh, so link with the existing systems that we have, as have other jurisdictions. So for example, recently the state patrol uh, shifted over to the same kind of system that we use. So we're able to auto import their data as opposed to entering it all um, by hand. So um, when the city manager discusses sort of the entrenchment, so to speak, um, it is it is from a very literal sense um, integrated. Uh, and because of that, we have a lot of um, efficiency savings and also not just internally, but with our other justice partners. That's helpful. Would you say that most municipalities and state now, like the patrol, do most of us use this same system? Uh, Mr. Mayor and council members, I don't know the answer to that. I think maybe Chief uh, Bodies might know better. But, yeah, Mayor yeah. members, the chief could probably answer that. There's WatchGuard, there's Axon, uh, and isn't there one other one? I guess I'm asking because um, I think about like the, the discounts, the better deals we get on our fleet vehicles and things like that. I'm just wondering if there is some kind of consortium. And of this is off the state, uh, Exxon is in the state contract too. So it's not like this is, uh, you know, we're getting priced uncompetitively or unfairly. Um, it is a, a state contract vendor approved okay. process. Yeah. Got it, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add, I appreciate the chief uh, reminding me is that in, in this area of um, equipment for our officers, uh, and the bundle of services that we're buying. We're also replacing uh, 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 tasers and other equipment uh, that is in uh, desperate need of replacement. Our tasers are, uh, many of them are in the neighborhood of 15, 20 years old, right? And so uh, they're just reaching a point in life where <laughs> we, we don't want to have any question about when the officer pulls the, the uh, tool from the belt, whether it's going to work or not. All right, so that's uh, necessary to replace all of that equipment as well. Chief Hodges, do you have a, just a ballpark breakdown on the different uses of the different camera systems in the jurisdictions in Minnesota? Yes, yeah, so like the uh, city manager said, this is uh, the price we're getting here is actually less than the state contract price. And this is a bundle package. It includes our tasers, 
our squad videos and our body camera um, features here. And not to speak too much off the cuff, quite frankly, a lot of agencies are dealing with this price increase just like we are. Yeah, yeah and I actually do want to uh, recognize that the number that we're presenting to you is less than the number that was originally offered to us. So our, our department has been working with the vendor to bring this price down uh, pretty significantly. So, so uh, just wrapping up before Kari jumps into some of the others, I, I thought it was really important that we address up front what the primary driver is in the budget so people understand that um, we have uh, necessary and I think expected um, uh, improvements and, and modernizations that we have to make in our public safety services. And again, never a criticism of anybody in the fire department or the police department. Uh, it's, it's simply that we're at a juncture where uh, the, the fire department model uh, needs to change and the police department um, needs to have investments made that haven't been made in uh, recent history. So, Kari. And before we jump to, uh, to Kari, I, I do notice this specific slide is not in our, our pack our packet, uh, if we can make sure that that gets added so yes. we can see it and so members of the public can see it as well. Be yes, the current uh, presentation will be updated and posted uh, first thing in the morning. Thank you. Yep. So next I'm going to share with you some feedback from the public from our engagement events. So if you remember, we talked about approaching public engagement a little differently this year. Uh, last year, we had four events, two virtual, uh, two in person. They were um, very lightly attended. Um, even when we had our celebrity guests of the mayor and the fire chief, that did bring in a few more people than just the budget manager. But still, uh, not a lot of people um, were interested just to come for something that was just about the budget, at least last year. So this year, we went out into the community, and we went out to events where we knew there would be people and um, engage them that way. And so here's some um, feedback from that. So the first uh, one we did was in May. It was at the police open house, and the police accountant, Abdi Awajama, joined me. And we had 54 people uh, that visited our booth, which was more than all of our engagement events combined last year. So I thought that was a success. Um, and it's, I think people are a lot more comfortable in that type of situation, just giving feedback and having more conversations. And we have a lot of handouts um, about property taxes, uh, property tax refund program. I talked to a lot of people about that. Um, we created a little budget and brief document. We had a QR code that linked right to our budget webpage and our Let's Talk Bloomington specific survey questions about the budget. We also realized at this event, uh, the Community Outreach and Engagement Division. Um, Nancy Brewster, she um, was there as well, and she had leftover popcorn from an event, so she let me have that, and that, uh, I learned, draws a lot of people to my table, so we picked up on that idea, and so for all of our events, we have little bags of Smart Pop popcorn, and we have a label with a QR code on it to our website, and so a lot of times people will first come over and wonder about the popcorn, and then we can kind of engage them that way. Um, because handouts don't always look as fun. But um, we had a big sign at, at these events, and at the top of it, it says, what do you want city council to know about your priorities for city services as it relates to the city budget? And people put all kinds of things, but I just wanted to share this with you. So this was the police open house, so I think things that they were learning about were on top of mind, but they talked about concerns of carjackings, catalytic converter uh, theft. Um, someone talked about uh, cleaning up the trash in the community was important to them. Disability services, having easier access um, to information about disability services, um, having more opportunities to donate for things, um, equitable access for all, concerns about homelessness, um, priority of inclusion, having more kids activities, and someone starred that, so I have a plus one. Having a late night police presence, um, mental illness was um, having resources to help with that. Recreation was important. Uh, safety had a lot of stars, and then services for people experiencing homelessness. So that was the May event. 
And in June, I went over to the Normandale Bandshell on a Tuesday night, and it was the Continental Ballet performance. And I had 22 people stop by there. And um, that's when I had my bags of popcorn, and uh, that definitely brought people over. And I learned it's better to kind of start these events before the music starts or the performance starts, because that's when people are mingling around. Um, so I'm kind of learning as I go on these. Um, things that they wanted to share with the council was, um, again, talked about homelessness, donating homelessness. The environment was important. Someone said they'd like to have more Latino events. I know there was a one at Normandale Bandshell concert that um, was very popular. People talked about addressing the buckthorn, um, having more public park events, outdoor music performances, spaces to exercise. Um, kids came up too. Um, so one of the children said uh, they wanted to have <laughs> comfortable seats in school, so I put it on there um, since they took the time to come and talk to me and, and write that down. Um, and someone was concerned about um, our Chamber of Commerce, um, which really isn't us, but how it became part of the regional Minneapolis chamber. They thought it was better when it was alone, but I explained that it was separate from us, but I put it on there anyway. And then in July... Um, it was our, we labeled all these like with different names. So this is Budget Beats and Treats. Um, at this one, we debuted our new budget game that um, to kind of get people to interact along with the popcorn. And so this is something I learned from the city of Duluth. Um, I met the budget manager from the city of Duluth at a conference, and we've been talking a lot. And we have a lot of, we've been sharing ideas for engaging the public. We kind of have the same struggles of trying to get feedback from the community. And this is something they do, and we kind of took our own take on it. But you can kind of see it lined up there. And I had, um, I had of course, uh, Chief Seal was there, and then uh, Faith Jackson, our Chief Inclusion um, Equity Officer was there, and then Brianna Eicheldinger from the Finance Department were all there to help me. And so we set up these different um, canisters with a, um, I'll show you, what was on top of them in a couple other slides, but we had um, different categories of city spending, and they we gave them a stack of 10 chips that represented property taxes, and they had six categories, and they could put them wherever they wanted. They could put them all in one, they could allocate them equally, however they wanted to do it. Um, and people were pretty, you know, thoughtful about it. Like, some people spent a long time, and they wanted to make sure, like, where, well, these are all important. You know, we want to fund them all, and like, and that's kind of the struggles that we deal with as a city. Um, but it was a good way, I think, also just to educate the public on what we spend city, prop, what our property taxes are spent on. But it was a way to engage and talk about things and kind of see visually where their priorities were. Um, so that was the first time that we had that. And so we had 45 people stop by. This was the um, 90s cover band uh, flannel that played, and it was a big crowd. We had 45 people come by. Some of the things they highlighted um, were was having disability housing, um, like apartments. Someone just wrote, thanks for your service, which is nice. Uh, climate and en energy con conservation efforts were important to them. Uh, they mentioned police, fire, first responders were priority. And then someone wrote, we value our police officers and their service, also the natural spaces in the city. We want public restrooms open and clean at our parks. So that was the feedback from that event. And then um, National Night Out, which all of you are at as well. This is my first time. Well, I've always gone to my neighborhood National Night Out party, but this is the first time I, I went to other parties with a police officer. So that was a fun experience. I went with uh, Sergeant Aaron Paul. We went to five parties in the southeast uh, corner of Bloomington and um, saw lots of people at the parties, but talked like more individually with about 30 people. And, um, and there's got some pictures there of uh, we were at a... Um, an apartment building where they were in their party room down there and all having root beer floats, and they were a lot of fun. They let us take pictures. Um, but some feedback was that they loved the briefing newsletter. Um, I, I was asking people at the parties kind of how do you um, usually get information about city services and the budget, and overwhelmingly it was the newsletter is where they usually get it, the people I talk to. Um, in that area of town, they shared with me that they would like to have more sidewalks and walkways, they wish they had. They wish that their the uncontrolled intersections that are currently around there had stop signs. Of course, as I'm sure it's not surprising. They um, don't want a community center to replace the Valley View Park and pool. That I had a lot of people tell me that. Um, people told me they don't like ranked choice voting um, in that area. Um, a few people that have lived in Bloomington a long time thought that Bloomington was changing too fast and they wanted it to be the way it was. 
And then someone uh, shared that they, they liked when Open, open Comet uh, was, um, was on camera, like in the council chambers. So that was feedback from that. And then my last one was um, earlier this month, uh, CFO Lori Economy Scholler and I went to um, the On The One Music Festival. So this is the third night of that music festival. Uh, we had 21 people stop by. It was a little kind of rainy and cold, um, but I'm really glad that I went to that. The music was amazing, and it was a really fun event. Um, people said they love the live music. They like that the city is sponsoring different types of concerts for the Arts and Park series, like that concert um, was bringing in a lot younger, more diverse audience than a lot of the Arts and the Parks events, so they wanted to see that continue, and uh, they thought affordable housing should be um, city's number one priority. So um, I'm just going to share with you. This is that budget game where they put the chips, their taxes, and the different canisters. This is what was at the top of each one of them. So we had one for parks, arts, recreation, and natural resources. So playgrounds, trails, recreation, programs, arts. Um, that was that category. And then we had one for facilities and infrastructure with the subpoints of uh, roads and bridges, health and wellness center, future. Um, ice Garden Center for the Arts, golf course. We had one for economic development, redevelopment, and housing that's affordable. So ensuring a community where people can live, work, and invest in their future. We had one for the police department with safety and security for the community. And then the fire department for fire safety and prevention. And so here, oh, I'm sorry. And then we also had community belonging and engagement. So people and neighborhood focused programs. So um, here's like the first one we did. You see a picture of what the chips looked like. So we're, we're counting them um, just to kind of get a sense of where people were at and how they were um, voting you know, with their chips. So the, the one in July for the 90s cover band, the top one there was the parks, arts, recreation, natural resources, followed by police. And then the one uh, this, earlier this month, the top one there was the economic development, redevelopment, housing that's affordable followed closely by parks, arts, recreation, natural resources. So just kind of interesting. We'll see. We'll do this again. Um, we have two more um, planned. So we have the farmer's market one and fire department. So, um, But overall, um, engage with a lot more people than we did last year. Councilmember Delisandro, question? <clears throat> Thanks, Mayor. Uh, hi, Kari. Um, I just, uh, I think you said that you gave out 10 chips for each person. So I was doing some quick math and it doesn't land exactly divisible by 10. So I'm kind of curious what, what, what happened in some cases, like how did, how did it, how does it vary from what we might expect if we added them all up and divided by 10 and we would say, okay, that's this number of people that responded or whatever. Sure. So mayor, council members, council member D'Alessandro, not everyone that um, came to the booth did the, the budget game. So some people just came and talked to us, but um, but as far as these added up and divided by 10? Yeah, I, I could be doing the math wrong, but when I divided the first column and divided it by 10, I got 23.3, which is not oh. even number, so I just was curious. Maybe some people took some. <laughs> well, Didn't use all yeah, that's what I was curious yeah, about, whether they yeah. said, I'll only do six or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Loman, a question? Hey, just a quick one. Um, uh, how did we get to these categories? And then um, was there any thought of just having one that's just for tax savings, you just you kind of empty category? So if you could talk about those two things, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, so Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Um, so we put these categories together with um, the city manager and the CFO and assistant city manager and um, kind of based like sort of how the city of Duluth kind of put them together too. So we're trying to break it into broad categories, but that is something we can look at if we want to continue doing this like next year, if we want just a, a, another one or change one of them out that says, you know, reduce property taxes or something like that, we could do that. And if I could, Mayor, you know what? I'll wait for strategy later. Just as a follow-up to that, Mr. Mayor. Council Member D'Alessandro. Yeah, it's so a follow-up to that question. Did anybody say that as part of feedback that you got at the booth, at least to say, like, why isn't there a category for 
not spending money or anything like that? Did you get any of that feedback? I didn't see it in here, but I'm curious if anybody made comments on that front. Thanks. Sure, Mayor, uh, Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, no. Um, really, the the experiences we had talking to people, they were very positive, and I think people that were putting the, their chips in the different categories were thinking of it very seriously and thinking it was important, but no one, no one said that. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so I just want to say that this is really fantastic, and I love that you were out at events where people were already going to and collecting information. And I guess <clears throat> in a similar vein, I'm just curious if there was any conversation around like the levy or anything specific about that, or was it really um, just focused on kind of the activity, kind of getting the broad, and then eventually we'll probably get more specific in our community engagement? Sure. Uh, Mayor, council members, council member Carter, um, there wasn't any discussion about where the levy might land or tax increases. Um, no one asked about that, and I think it was very preliminary still. We were just more high level getting feedback of what is important to residents. Okay, thank you. And I think it's important to remember, I think there's at least one or two booths that do this similar kind of thing at the state fair. They use kernels of corn or marbles or whatever. And um, I, I think you, you take the results with a grain of salt uh -huh. because it's, uh, I mean, it's folks who, it's not scientifically specific or, or authentic here, I don't think, but it's just a good, it's a good feedback mechanism. It gives people a chance to, it starts the conversation and, and gets an idea where folks might be going, so. Although kernels of corn, I think, would have been better, but I won't say that. <laughs> Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, one, one small thing before we move on. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you. Uh, just one more thing. It looks like you have two more events that you're planning to do. Are you, um, are, at, during this session at all, are you looking for any input from us about what to, okay, thank you. Yes. It's actually one of the slides we added at the end, Council Member D'Alessandro. So. <laughs> New slide. Yep. So I just wanted to take a moment, and we talked about this earlier in the year, that the approach for this budget is really to embrace the, the new mission of to cultivate an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. So as um, departments were looking through the services that they provide and what was needed to execute them um, efficiently and do it well that they were taking this new strategic plan into consideration and how their budget requests lined up with it. And so they were focused on the core values, so transformation will come through the collective courage and the willingness to take risks. The community thrives when its members share responsibility for its well-being. When diversity is embraced, the community is strengthened. Everyone benefits when there is equitable access to opportunity and safety and security are critical components of a healthy community. Now we get into the numbers, more numbers. Okay, um, so the working budget models, um, this slide you've seen previously, and just to kind of remind you of what the markets did to valuations and how, you know, and how the valuations of property determines how the overall property tax levy that you set is allocated. And last year we had the situation where the residential values were skyrocketing and the commercial values had plummeted. And so even though our overall tax levy increase last year was 2.75%, a lot of residential property tax owners were seeing their property taxes going up a lot more because the, the shift of their valuations going up and shifting over from commercial. So that's not the case um, for this 2023 property taxes that were paid in 2023 um, across the board. The different property types did increase, um, and so we don't have that that um, dynamic where one's going up and one's going down. And, the, and then just to highlight for you, as, as you know, and people watching, that these percentages does not mean that this is what the property taxes are going up by. Um, it's the valuation of the properties is just how the overall tax levy gets allocated. And this is just um, some reference of what our tax levy increases uh, for the city of Bloomington have been since 2016. So you've got uh, the most recent one at the top, you've got the years on the left, 
And then the preliminary tax levy dollar amount is you know what what the city council sets is that dollar amount. And then the, what the final tax levy was. And in all those years there, the final tax levy was less than the preliminary tax levy, except for last year. So you, I also have the preliminary tax levy increase, the percentage um, for the preliminary and the final. And so last year we started a lot lower than we had um, at 2.75%, and then it stayed there. So in the other years, it started a bit higher and then came down. Um, so I'm going to go through a, um, a tax levy that shows just like the base budget for 2023, but I wanted to point out that that base budget does include some new positions uh, that were not in the 2022 budget. So if you recall, um, at the end of last year, we were talking about the 2022 budget. There were some new uh, positions proposed that were included in there, but um, council directed us to take those out of the 2022 budget, and instead we um, funded them from strategic priorities for like the first year they started, and they um, had to do with you know council initiatives or strategic priorities of the council. So there was a new equity and inclusion specialist that was added. There's two positions with for compliance that are added. Um, there was a community health worker position added, but that is funded by American Rescue Plan funds, so that's not an increase um, for property taxes, and that will be funded in 22 and in 2023. And public health is going to try to find grant support to continue that position, or they'll evaluate at that time if that's something they're going to they want to keep. And then the four firefighter positions that um, have come online now, so those eight are more than what were in the 2022 budget. Okay, and so this is um, kind of the 2023 base budget. And what we mean by that is it's the positions that we've had um, with projected salary benefit increases, including those that I just went over. Um, and, and that's really, and then that's really it as far as any kind of increases. Um, and then also, though, um, an increase in the communications fund of 105000 an in increase in the ice garden fund. Uh, we have a reduction in the strategic priorities from 600000 to 500000 So for just, like, general revenues, that's a 5.49% increase in the property tax levy. And then the debt service is an additional 2.27%. And so that's... To, that includes, we were talking about the fire station for debt service, but also it has two years, because um, we did issue bonds for uh, two years to take advantage of lower interest rates, which um, seems to be a very good thing that we did because they they keep marching up. Um, but that is a higher you know, increase in debt service uh, for 2023. So, so just starting off, and so this doesn't have any kind of increases. We say when we're working on these budgets internally, we say for discretionary spending, which means it's not preloaded as salary and benefits or internal charges. It's what the departments put in for their needs for um, what they need for uh, services. And but what the executive leadership team made, a, made sure to make a point of um, telling me is that if they were to not have any increases, it doesn't mean like it would be the same level of service because with inflation and how much you know fuels costs have gone up and supplies and materials, there would have to be cuts to be able to like hit that same budget number for 2023. So a base budget doesn't mean we would keep being able to um, have the same level of service. If that makes sense. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mayor. Uh, two quick questions. One, um, can you remind me why the communications went up 33% or so? Yes, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson. That, the simple answer to that one is for the communications budget, basically the main driver of revenue is franchise fees um, from the cable company, and that is not increasing. If anything, it's maybe being stable or decreasing slightly while other 
um, expenses are increasing as far as staff and um, you know all the costs for the monthly briefing and um, all the things that the communications division does. So in, in order to have enough money coming in to, to cover those expenses, we had to increase the property tax support. And if I could, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, it's a good question. And as Carly, uh, Carly. Carly. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I don't know. Uh, as Carly indicated, uh, that's, that's an issue that's going to be compounding every year just because of all the cord, cu the cord cutting that's going on. Our revenue comes solely from cable, um, uh, people who, who purchase Comcast cable. As more people go to Hulu or other platforms like that uh, and utilize uh, Comcast less, that means that the, the revenue is frankly maxing out. And so just the year over year um, cost to maintain our communication staff um, starts to create additional cost beyond what we're recapturing with the revenues. Good. Thank you for that explanation. My second question kind of dovetailing on that is, is it possible to get um, an indication of the change in the levy based on revenue, like the falling revenue from communications, liquor, lodging, things of that nature versus an increase in expenses and costs? Um, just to help us understand where those things are driving from because I think they're two different, in my mind, two different issues and two different ways to manage them. Yes, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Nelson, we can pro provide that information. Yes. Okay. So when the initial budget request came in, um, there were a number of staffing requests that were in this budget, in the initial budget. And uh, we refer to them as B7 requests. So I think in some of these slides we have B7 written. And it's a, it's a budget form. It's like budget form number seven. It's for staffing requests. So it, it's everything from a new full-time position. We've kind of talked through some of those with the police positions, fire position requests. Um, there's a number of other positions as well. Um, I think you've talked, um, heard about facilities needs for new positions and some of the other city council meetings. Um, so here's just a recap of everything. And we're also working on a 24 conceptual budget as well. So we have some 24 requests as well. So there were 30 full-time position requests uh, for four part-time, seven that were existing part-time positions that we have that were requested to be full-time, and then uh, 12 uh, reclassifications, and then 15 new in, um, in uh, 2024 and one part-time. So I think that's been a record of <laughs> requests since, um, since I've uh, been here, but I think it's kind of as Jamie was talking about before, just the need of um, being able to execute the services and um, what is needed in the departments right now. And so we can get more, more into details of that, but here's, that's the summary. And then this is it broken out by department. So it's um, five in administration, that's uh, HR, city clerk, um, uh, Office of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, um, city manager's office, and then nine in community development. These are not all full-time, but you can see them broken out there. Um, you've, the six in fire that we've talked about, one in IT, there's some requests in legal, in parks and recreation. Um, police had eight, six officers um, requests, and then two uh, civilian police requests. And then uh, public works had 10, uh, 13 total and 10. So it's kind of the, the breakout. Um, uh, question oh, yep. real quick, uh, Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Can you talk a little bit about why reclassifying an existing position then counts toward an increase in our overall, the overall staffing requests? Sure, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Carter. So 
this is just a table of when all of these B7 requests come in, there's different categories of them. And then for me, entering it into the budget, it's 53 different things I had to put into the 2023 budget. But um, as far as like our full-time staff number that we publish in the budget book, it would be that top one with full-time positions. Like if all of those were to be included in the 2023 budget, the full-time staff would go up thir by 30. And Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter, uh, the, the reason that we have reclassifications in here along with new staff uh, ads or increase from part-time to full-time is because they also have some level of uh, compensation increase associated with them. So for those who are watching and may not understand the terminology, uh, reclassification of a position, we have a, we have a compensation plan that slots all of our positions uh, based on the responsibilities and the complexity of the work. And um, it, depending on where somebody is in the compensation plan, if the nature of their job duties change uh, to warrant a reclassification, that's when, that's when we uh, would process that. And typically that moves um, that position into a different pay grade than it had been before. So to give you an example of um, one that's in the budget for this year, we will uh, come up as we're going through. Um, <clears throat> we have a reclass proposed for our existing sustainability coordinator because adding a person into that unit that would report to the sustainability uh, coordinator um, creates different job expectations and responsibilities than currently exist. Um, so that's why we would then go back and reclassify that position as a result. Thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And just again, to reiterate what you said and for those listening, it's not necessarily that the city, that city staff have put in requests for 53 new positions, right? It is 30 new positions, right. but then all of the other changes. Right, correct. Yep. Okay. Council Member Lohman. So Mayor, just, uh, this is a study session. So um, just for the, the public that's viewing this, you know, you see 3.1 million increase in 2023 general fund budget. Uh, just so we're, we're, we're clear, those folks who are, who are watching, uh, that, that this is just a proposed. Um, I almost wish we could have used, I know request kind of says the same thing. And then uh, my, my secondary uh, question uh, is, you know, the 3.1 million, although it seems obvious to me, uh, we got the 4.5 that came earlier, kind of include some of these uh, pieces. So it's not a 4.5 plus 3.1 million. So just in case somebody was looking at this and maybe... Uh, put those two numbers together, we're not doing that, right? Just just so I'm clear, right? Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, that's correct. And I would I would say just for the terminology, request is what the department submitted to the finance department uh, based on the directions that were given by the city manager back in May when we started our budget process. And, and what those instructions included was uh, submit requests for what you think is necessary based on expectations in the community, where we are currently in providing service level, and um, understanding the strategic priorities of the community, what you think is necessary for the services going forward. Okay. So these are the requests that they submitted. I don't think that any of the department directors thought that all of these requests would be funded. Right. This essentially is framing the issue for the, um, for the city manager and uh, the finance team about what they think, what the um, experts in each of our departments think is necessary to do the work. Uh, and also it communicates to the council that we do have um, certain needs to, pr to deliver our services that aren't being accounted for today. And we'll continue to accommodate those areas where we can't account for all of those things. Um, so the request is what was submitted by the departments. Um, what's proposed is coming up, and uh, I, I want to caution again: that's not even that's not the final. I don't want anybody to be watching to assume that what we're talking about here is done. This is the first conversation we've had with the council, and we expect that there are going to be changes as a result. And thank you for that clarification, because I I, I was assuming that we had the second part of this to come. And I just want to make sure that everybody understands that as well, that these were, this was the staffing request. This isn't necessarily what's in the proposed budget that's coming forward to us. Yes. So to prepare you for the next slide that I'm going to show, um, this, what I put together to, sh to um, share with the city manager and the executive leadership team is if we were to 
put all of this in, like what that would require for a property tax levy increase as a starting place to bring it down because it was way too high, as you can imagine from what I've just kind of gone through. So this is what putting everything in initially without making any types of reductions was a 19.01% uh, increase in the tax levy. So that's almost $13 million. So clearly we had to... $13 million dollars new. Yeah, yeah. 13, additional $13 million. So that was what came out when departments were asked what, what they needed to um, deliver the service that they felt was expected and um, so that the community expected. So... Um, that's everything in there without changing anything with debt service or anything else. So we don't need to spend a lot of time on there because that's so that's where we started. And then the next slide is things that we reduced. So um, from that initial request, we took out four point nine million dollars. And so I'll just run through the things that we have taken out. Um, so. One thing we did is we reduced the property tax subsidy for the aquatics fund by $50,000. The, uh, the pool has had um, two amazing years. They've had very hot, dry, busy summers. And we can't always budget for them to have hot, dry summers like they've had. Um, we do a little more conservatively. Uh, but because of how much revenues come in, we were, able, we were comfortable bringing down the tax levy um, support, the property tax support by 50000 can, um, can I jump in there too, Kari, yes. uh, Mayor and Council? The, so the, the reason that with a couple of these we make these modifications is we run a 10-year forecast model for our enterprise funds uh, and many of the other funds, so that uh, it, like the internal service funds. So we're able to see year-to-year -year changes, impacts uh, into the future and what that means for the what we call the working capital balances within those funds. Um, so we're able to see the benefit of the last couple years at the Family Aquatic Center uh, and the better than expected revenues, um, the positive impact that has on the future and um, can analyze what a potential change in, in the tax subsidy will mean long term and we're comfortable with where that leaves us. Um, something similar for the, the fire pension fund. So we had we had one million fifty thousand dollars programmed in for um, tax support f for the fire pension fund knowing that in some years we do have to make significant um, fire obligation fire pension obligation payments we have had a, a few years of um, very good results so that fund balance has built up um, nicely but we know that looking back at history there's times where we have to make large payments but 50 we are comfortable also bringing down that tax subsidy um, by fifty thousand dollars. For 2023, um, there was some request in the city manager administration budget with the Bloomington Tomorrow Together performance management software, um, also some employee evaluation software. Um, we took that out of the budget. We put that into strategic priorities for the council to consider. Um, we also, in the city clerk's budget, um, they had a uh, 2020, for 2023, an election citywide mailer with a lot of information, voting information. Um, we, we took that out of the general fund budget as well and put that, it was more, like more of a one-time thing into strategic priorities. And the, and the purpose of that, Mayor and Council, is because of the redistricting that's occurring. So we want to make sure that no <laughs> nobody is confused um, by redistricting. So. The community... Uh, uh, oh. Councilmember Coulter? Sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, just a very quick question here. You may have said it and I just missed it. Um, the performance management and employee evaluation software, that's a one-time expense, correct? That's not... There are some ongoing right. um, subscription costs associated with it. Okay. Yeah. So it may be, and it's, it's not a significant amount, um, but in, in the uh, second or third year that we'll have to look at whether we want to maintain it within strategic priorities or bring it back into the department budget. Okay. When you when you say it's not a significant amount, what is that? It's like thirty thousand dollars a year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The community outreach and engagement budget um, had some additional overtime and supplies. Just planning on thinking that they would have um, a need for additional outreach events that the city council would want them to do. So we did move that over 
to strategic priorities. So if there are additional things that you would like the Community Outreach and Engagement Division to do that would be above and beyond their, their budget, um, it can be funded out of strategic priorities. Um, one thing that we do in the general fund is there is a chargeback to the non-general funds, like the utility funds, enterprise funds, um, for, um, for example, like for the city manager's office, for finance, for legal, so that their budgets show the kind of the true cost of doing their business. Um, so they have that overhead cost in there. And when we added in, we have a new office of racial equity, inclusion, and belonging, and additional expenses. Um, initially, when we did the budget, we didn't have any chargebacks for them, but it does make sense to charge that back to the utility funds and enterprise funds because they do work a lot in the, those areas. So we did um, we increased the overall general fund chargebacks. Um, when you see the fleet budget, uh, there were some pretty uh, significant increases in costs for vehicles, um, and uh, so in, in char we haven't really increased any of our internal service charges for the last two or three years just with budget constraints and so they're trying to kind of make up um, some revenues that they need to make to, to be able to um, get their working capital balances back to where they need to be and then just um, cover their costs but um, from their initial increases we brought that back down about uh, $387,000 so it's not as high as it was, but still higher than last year. Um, we took out from the, the levy the amount that is for strategic priorities. So we took that from 500,000 down to zero. Um, those B7 staffing requests that I um, showed you, we removed, we took the majority of those out. Um, we'll go, Jamie will go over the ones um, that he's recommending to keep. Uh, we did reduce, uh, police overtime by quite a bit and some of their other expenses. Um, also included in the Public Works General Fund budget, um, there were four um, additional sidewalk snow plows that were requested. So each one was $200,000. Um, and we can give some more information about that. But that was a pretty significant cost. And so we, we did take that out. And if you want to get some more information about that, we can have... Um, Public Works Director Carl Keel can share information about that. Um, I think Councilmember Nelson, you were talking about the um, revenue side of this. So there definitely is, even with all this, how high that property tax levy was initially, we are seeing increases in um, lodging and admission taxes um, coming back faster than we were forecasting. And Jamie's going to go over some of that in a little bit here. But um, we were pretty comfortable um, increasing our lodging and admission tax revenue forecast a, a bit more than it was, so that helped a little bit. And then also, um, we had that big increase for debt service, and um, our CFO, Lori Economy Scholler, she was um, able to abate uh, one of the debt service payments with our, we do have an, some money in our PIR revolving debt service fund that we could abate a portion of it, so we brought that down by 514000 um, so putting that all in, um, oh, uh, hold on yes. one second. Councilmember yes. D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, before you move on, I, just a quick question. Are we, we have an, <clears throat> an expectation through these chargebacks that we're going to see that come back to us as it relates to either requests for utility fund increases or other things like that? Does that, is that essentially what we should expect if we are suggesting that, we would increase these chargebacks there, then those funds need to go up to accommodate? Um, Mayor and council members, council member D'Alessandro, yes, that is correct. There, um, there, there, It is gonna be absorbed by those other budgets, but that amount spread out over all of those budgets won't make a material impact on their overall budgets. It wouldn't, it wouldn't require a rate increase from what they'd already planned on doing. Gotcha, okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Councilmember Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, quick question about the um, uh, the strategic priorities. We're decreasing that from 500,000 to zero in this model. Last year, we had a positive budget variance of 6.3 million. 
I think about approximately 3.5 million of which we um, have allocated to various programs, leaving approximately 2.8 million left from that. Uh, how does is that just sitting in that working capital fund, um, or is it available for other uses? Can you? Am I misunderstanding it? Um, it just can you help me understand that? Mr. Mayor and Council members, we actually allocated uh, much more of that because we had the we had the um, uh, positive budget variance amount, and then we also had an amount that we were over our forty percent uh, targeted general fund reserve. Um, so the amount that we allocated, um, looking over at our CFO, was uh, closer to six million dollars in total. So the uh, you know, I think inevitably the question is, and the question was asked when we talked about it before, could those funds have been used here? And uh, the answer is yes, and um, it would have created a significant structural imbalance in the budget because that would have just been utilizing one-time dollars to buy down uh, levy increases. So what we allocated those funds for were one-time um, spending projects uh, so that we didn't create that structural imbalance. And council is aware, but just to flag it again, we already are carrying a little bit of a structural imbalance in our budget to the tune of about $1.1 million, which we are absorbing with our strategic priorities fund. And that was an intentional effort coming out of the um, downturn related to uh, the COVID economy um, that we, we knew that um, we did not want to increase the tax levy for um, residents any further than what we did at that 2.75%. And so we created that amount in there and recognized that we would need to carry that for a couple of years before um, we could fully come back. So I, I think adding any of those funds in would have further complicated our, our financial position by having a significant structural imbalance between our revenues and our, our expenses. Which I agree with, and we had that discussion earlier, especially when we're talking about positions moving forward. But we did see in the public safety expenditures quite a bit of equipment and training and so on. Yes. Uh, could any of those equipment costs be offset by any of that? In uh, yes, if we have if we have additional uh, reserves, there there's probably a fair amount of uh, equipment and supply. The, um, in this upcoming budget that potentially we could utilize those funds for. But again, we'd have to go back and look because we've we've committed a number of those funds already. So uh, if that's uh, something council would like us to do, we can go back and revisit. Okay, good to know. Yep. Council Member D'Alessandro? Just as a um, follow-up to that. So Council Member Nelson mentioned, I, I can remember the three and a half million against six million that means there's two and a half million where, where did that go can you help because it sounds like you're saying it's committed so could you just remind us where that is thanks do you have the do you have the list of the allocations oh, I can bring that up. Yeah. but um mayor council members council member d'alessandro so the it is sitting in the, it's in the strategic priorities fund um currently so um it is in that fund and we have a long-term model kind of showing um that balance being spent like with a certain amount of money that the council could designate each year. I think it's around $800,000, you know, each year modeled out. Right. So, so if I can sum up then the, the, um, one of the reasons, one of the reasons to recommend that we don't charge a levy, uh, a portion of the levy to the strategic priorities tax fund t this time is because that balance exists. Is that a fair way to characterize the recommendation? We don't need to have, we don't need to do that this coming year this potentially levy. because right. we already have that balance. Yeah. Um, Is that correct? So, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council members, the, the the reason that we had included a levy for the Strategic Priorities Fund uh, going back a number of years was just to continually supplement that fund. Um, there was an intentional strategy to try to build it up. Uh, <clears throat> and then we add in the positive budget variance. Um, we had uh, we had eliminated that levy uh, during the COVID budgets and brought them down to zero. Last year, we brought that levy back again uh, f to $600,000. Uh, again, trying to build up the strategic priorities fund. Um, 
and so as we look again, because we plot out the next eight to 10 years, again, we're, we're relatively comfortable with, with the running balance on that account, which right now is in the neighborhood of uh, more than $5 million. And I think we'll probably, uh, you know, at least in the next 10 years, still stay in, in the neighborhood of $2 million on the, in the far uh, years out even if we don't do anything. so But that includes bringing back the levy at some point. It doesn't include having the levy zeroed out every year. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mayor. That's Mayor Nelson. Uh, yeah, appreciate that. Um, j just to note, am I misunderstanding? Because it looks like we have a balance at the end of 2022 of over $9 million in strategic priorities, which will go down to about $7.7 .7 at mm -hmm. the end of 2023. Is it five or is it nine? Um, and then yeah, you're, you're correct, Council Member Nelson. Sorry, I misspoke. Yeah. And, you know, the going forward number gets down to uh, about $3.7 million. Um, and that doesn't include any uh, potential hopeful positive budget variance that would go into it in future dates, and which is part of, you know, I think I agree kind of with the comments of, of the mayor, if there's some one-time spending that we might be able to take out of there to help with this, that that may make a, a lot of sense given the significant balance that we have sure. in that account currently due to the overperformance from last year. I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that has to do with the fact that our hospitality industry is doing much better than we thought it would. It's coming back quicker than we thought, and I think that that's a positive thing. And if we can utilize that to kind of bridge that gap. I think that was a really good idea on, on your part to take care of some of those one-time things as we look at this budget. Um, absolutely agree with the city manager in terms of structurally, we need to be as close as possible to doing that and not just, I'm not looking to just push this down to you know future yep. years, but um, we, we do have a healthy balance there right now. I apologize. I think I pushed this into more than questions of clarification no, okay. and uh, the, a policy question. I'm sorry about that. No, that's helpful. Uh, um, and actually, uh, I appreciate the clarification too because I, I clearly misunderstood what you were asking, Mr. Mayor. Is that uh, I was I was understanding that you were thinking about reallocating the decision that we had already made rather than looking at the balance of the fund to take care of some of these priorities um, in the next year or so. And, and like I said, I'm sorry I brought. I brought, I think I nope. got us off track a little bit. We'll, we can come back to this discussion as we as we get a bit more into the policy discussion. All good. So, so with these reductions, um, it's went from 19% increase to 11.58%. So you can see um, the general fund increase there. Um, you can see the fire pension and the aquatics pension coming down 50,000. You can see the strategic priorities going down to zero. Um, and you can see in the debt service that it's now a million dollars. So instead of 2.5% increase, it's 1.5% increase. So at, at this point, with um, this is kind of where we're at right now um, with the preliminary levy. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie Thank to you. talk about those those staffing changes, and these are the ones that are still in there. So as I said at the beginning, Mr. Mayor and Council members, that uh, this is first and foremost a, a public safety budget that we're putting forward, but it is not exclusively uh, public safety because we do have other needs in our operations, as was evidenced by the requests that were submitted by all the directors, uh, as well as uh, desire by the City Council to start investing in some areas of strategic uh, importance and concern. Uh, so the the position recommendations uh, for the purpose of this, dis this discussion is that we have 14 positions, the six full-time firefighters that we discussed, uh, the three police positions, the, uh, the park keeper for natural resources, which uh, we have uh, previously discussed uh, around our park system master plan and, and how we're going to start prioritizing that work. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. I'm not going in order here. Um, the maintenance worker, um, and, and this is related to the facilities assessment that was brought to City Council within the last couple months. Uh, you'll recall that that recommended that we should add uh, over the course of several years, uh, upwards of eight positions. Um, we're asking for one in the, in the budget moving forward and that's uh, in the facilities fund, it's not in the general fund. 
Um, but again, there are chargebacks from facilities to uh, general fund um, budgets. And then back up at the top, uh, you see the uh, human resources representative. Um, our, the structure of our human resources uh, unit is that we have two HR reps, representatives, uh, that do the great majority of work with departments uh, on recruitment and selection and uh, managing employees. And frankly, uh, uh, the, the amount of uh, turnover that's occurring in the last couple of years and what we're forecasting to continue uh, is overwhelming the staff capacity that we have. Uh, so we, we really need to add a person there just to manage the number of transitions in staff that we have, uh, especially if we are going to be on a uh, several-year process here of adding uh, uh, numerous public safety positions, firefighters and police officers, as we're trying to forecast. Um, and, you know, part of this, <laughs> I've had a couple of you ask, well, what's, what's going on with the turnover rate? Uh, and I want to be clear about a couple of things here. I don't think that we're very different from uh, uh, most other people in the business, frankly, right now of being an employer, that uh, employees are um, recognizing that they're very portable and they're very competitive and they have opportunities and options that maybe they weren't willing to explore before. Um, we do exit interviews with all of our employees. Um, we look for uh, trends or indicators of uh, issues that would maybe lead to higher turnover. Um, we've especially paid attention uh, to issues related to our BIPOC employees to make sure that we have a culture that is a work culture that is uh, welcoming to all. Uh, we're not seeing any real uh, uh, indicators there that we have an issue uh, above and beyond what we're just seeing in the general marketplace of, of people movement. Um, so uh, we're, you know, the great, what do they call it, the great departure or the great uh, retirement or whatever those phrases are, we're, we're experiencing it as well. So, And then uh, the two sustainability positions, uh, one of which is uh, funded through the general fund, the other through the solid waste fund. Uh, one would be uh, in the area of um, uh, solid waste to help expand our organics recycling and just generally uh, help manage our solid waste uh, and recycling programs, uh, working with Laura Horner. And then in the general fund, uh, that would be working with Emma Struss, our sustainability coordinator, and the primary emphasis of that position would be growing our energy savings programs and making sure that residents who are um, interested in pursuing those uh, also have access to incentive programs to help them do that. Uh, as council is aware, when it comes to our sustainability efforts, uh, emissions and uh, building energy are the two biggest areas of opportunity for us. Uh, and the position that's being added uh, is focused on the um, effort that's necessary uh, to make sure that building energy improvements are being made community-wide. So those are the 14 positions. Um, there are a number of positions that uh, aren't on here that have merit. Um, th there are a couple that are still in flux, but if we, um, if we include them and we'll come back to the council to discuss, we'll be doing so within uh, movement in, inside of department's budgets or just in the total budget overall. But we'll consult with council just because, uh, you know, we're still three and a half months away from adopting a final budget and conditions can change. Um, forecasting one of those going back to some of my comments at the very beginning of the meeting, um, requests from the uh, legal department for staffing uh, to help manage the digital evidence um, and, and just some of the other pressures that they have in the legal department um, that, you know, going from 5,000 bits of evidence to over 25,000 uh, doesn't happen without having staff capacity to do it, right? So we have to figure out how we're going to account for that. Um, so there may still be some fluctuation just in the position profiles that are presented for your consideration. Um, the other thing that I, I, I Mr. Verbrugge, yeah. along those quest, along that line of the position profiles, I, I'm noticing here of these 14 proposed full-time positions, these are not management, these are not administrative, these are not necessarily supervisory. These are, um, these are, these are oh, all frontline front service, frontline service providers. You bet. you bet. Thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Mayor. Um, the other thing that I would say has to do with our, um, our uh, firefighter staffing model. We've talked to the council 
quite a bit over the last couple of years about pursuing um, federal grant opportunities that will help us accelerate the transition to a full-time department. And we do currently have um, pending with FEMA request for 18 new full-time firefighters that would be fully funded by the federal government for three years. And then at the end of those three years, uh, they become the full responsibility of the city that um, receives the grant. Um, so we would have to plan for a financial transition so that we don't suddenly have a, you know, a $2 million bogey uh, when the grant goes away. Um, if we, we, we do not know the status of that grant. We probably will not know the status of that grant until uh, October, or maybe even as late as November in this year. Um, we did apply for it last year. We did not receive it. There were only two cities in Minnesota that did receive a safer grant. Um, I think the likelihood is that we will not receive it. Um, if we do, there will that will present some opportunity and some flexibility, perhaps. I think Chief Seal would love to have 24 new firefighters, right? That would be like the best case scenario. And so we could continue with the working model budget that we're showing and then still take on the additional 18. Um, we'd, we'd probably have some increased costs associated with um, uh, supply and, and other uh, training. But um, for the most part, we would be able to onboard 24. Uh, you could take a more measured approach uh, and just go with the 18 that were provided and you know reallocate budget for these six. That's going to be a discussion that we have only at such time that we know whether we're getting the grant or not. But I, I just want to make sure that we keep that in front of you because we've talked about that safer grant numerous times in the past and uh, it is still um, pending. We don't know whether we'll receive it or not. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to clarify, these positions listed here for the fire and police departments, those are the, sa the same positions you were referring to at the beginning of the presentation. Correct. correct? And those, those, and I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, those are entirely funded within the general fund. So also correct. That 4.465 million number that you referenced at the beginning, that, that comes straight out of that 7.424 number in the general fund. Correct. Okay. Just yep. wanted to make sure I was following all the line items correctly. Yeah, and let me and thank you for that opportunity to clarify, Councilmember Coulter. The 4.5 rounded, uh, 4.5 million dollars of new public safety investment um, leaves about 3.3 million dollars of other increases in the budget. And uh, a good number of those, you see a, a couple of staff here, but the staff that are here are not driving that number. Um, that number is largely being driven by just the existing cost of having uh, 562 full-time employees uh, and the annual um, costs associated with uh, compensation increases and benefit increases and everything that goes along with it. So, um, you know, what's requested new in the budget uh, is um, is predominantly public safety. So. Thank you, Mayor. And I'll be careful not to get into uh, questions outside of clarification here. So um, you mentioned uh, potential grant funding, very skeptical of it. Um, but is there grant funding for any of the sustainability positions or the natural resource position that we might be pursuing? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I know our staff is always uh, looking for grant opportunities. I'm not familiar with any that they have um, applied for just yet. Uh, I also know that our uh, new grants administrator, uh, Janet Burns, is working closely with departments. Um, you, you might remember last year when we were talking about the grant position was my uh, optimism that we would find a unicorn because a lot of the staff was concerned about the, the grant administration and reporting, the compliance aspects once we receive the grants. Uh, my hope was that we would have somebody who had the skill to also go out and start identifying grant opportunities and working with uh, departments uh, to help write those grant applications. Uh, I'm looking over at Lori. I think we found our unicorn in Janet. She's very good. She has been focused this year on uh, the compliance and reporting because that was the priority. I'm expecting that we're going to start to see um, more uh, in terms of uh, grant pursuit. And, and I think there probably are a number of opportunities out there. Okay. Great. Um, and then second question, 
Can you help me get my head around um, the human resource one because of the increase in particularly fire, but also police? Because um, what I'm seeing is the, on the fire side, we're moving from paid on call, which has is a person has a, an administrative burden to it, from human resources, I would assume, to a employee. Um, but ultimately, if I'm understanding the numbers, we'll have fewer people because we have full employees. So with that, can you help me understand the the necessity for additional human resources making that shift from sure. paid on call to full time employee? Even if there aren't more. Sure. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, uh, Council Member Nelson, I focused uh, uh, specifically on the recruitment and selection part of that job, but it's not the only aspect of those jobs. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, frankly, we need to be doing more of that uh, we are not doing organizationally is employee training, whether it's mandated training um, or just uh, developmental training. Um, frankly, we, we do not have a good regiment of uh, ongoing training for employees. And that's also work that falls within the scope of our human resource representatives. Um, the transition for the fire department is, um, is not necessarily going to be a reduced number of uh, firefighters, whether they're full-time or um, paid on call, just simply because of the amount of transition over the next several years. Uh, as we have paid on call firefighters continue to retire and we're constantly recruiting for those, we're actually going to be hiring ideally in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 firefighters every year between the full time and the um, paid on call uh, over the course of, of that transition. So, Chief, did I get that mostly correct? I think Chief is comfortable that I got that mostly correct. Did, did I get that okay? I didn't bollocks that too much. <laughs> There we go. All right. See, see, if we had more firefighters out there right now, the chief wouldn't be monitoring our calls. So, <laughs> Council, additional questions? Councilmember Bowman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'm, I'm not looking for an answer now. And you kind of alluded to it earlier, um, uh, Manager, uh, just in terms of the the staffing piece. And I know some of it is a is a judgment of you, Manager, and there's just no way to it to kind of quantify it at all. But I just I'm I'm very curious about experience. Uh, I look good. Uh, experience, turnover, salary, capacity, marketing, marketing competitive. You can go on and on with with that list of things. But I'm I'm just curious about. You know, you know, one, how do we how do we stack up? You know, what are some of those um, ongoing expenses you know, that that are, that are out there um, uh, in terms of just understanding how you are presenting um, what we have here today and what you see as kind of the ongoing costs in the current environment, um, sure. if that makes sense. And, and I know you can't. There's no way you can give me an answer today, but I'm just. You know, as we're kind of moving along, um, that's just something that, you know, as a policymaker, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, what, what those drivers are that are for those individual things against experience. You know, so for example, folks who are retiring, uh, that, that turnover piece we talked about before, um, we look at salary and the market of competitiveness, you know, you're bang for your buck. You know, uh, if you pay a higher salary, can you get more employees to do more work? or less, and then the capacity, you talked about with the police, um, do we other, have other capacity issues across staffing, uh, you know, for example, health, because we're all constantly doing grants, is that the best way to do it, you know, so those are kind of the questions I have from Clarity, and again, not looking for an answer right now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Uh, and actually, that's helpful because at the end here, we're going to uh, ask Council to provide us some feedback on what information you would like more of as we go through the next several months. Um, the uh, uh, Assistant City Manager and the HR team has put together um, some some good numbers, so I can give you just a, you know, just going into my folder here, um, this is stuff I should have had off the top of my head, but I didn't remember all of the numbers tonight. Um, so... Last year, we had 86 uh, recruitments. Through the end of May this year, we'd had 75 already. Right? And so we're, we're not expecting that kind of churn to slow down. It may not be on that order each year, but it's certainly above and beyond what we're already experiencing. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look and we'll provide some uh, background information also on the turnover rate and some of those other indicators that we're looking at. And if I could just say one thing, um, 
know, I've had the opportunity to go to a lot of conferences with the mayor and that kind of thing. I'm looking much more for high level things and not not into the detail. I think you know, I, I trust staff to kind of get the detail level right because I think it's almost almost impossible to try to get details. So just kind of these broad strokes like that was a great example of a, a broad stroke. So thanks. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, a couple of quick things here. I So the sustainability uh, specialist position being funded through the Solid Waste Fund, uh, I, thank you for the email earlier today. Uh, so the outreach on that for organics, I guess what's the thinking of housing that there as opposed to outreach and engagement division? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Martin, uh, um, first of all, um, I don't know that we have capacity within co-ed to absorb that work. So, uh, you know, we'd be looking at a new staff somewhere. Our co-ed division is within the general fund, although you could certainly, if you wanted to place a position there, you could utilize solid waste utility funds to do it. I think the, the issue here is just where the expertise is and the, the working unit that is um, the, the best home for that work. And I don't know that we'd want to put somebody doing similar work to what's already being done in a different division. Um, it, you know, they are, so here's the long-term vision about outreach and engagement, right? And talk to the staff about this too. Um, we have, uh, we have four outreach and engagement, uh, coordinators and they're excellent at, at what they do. Uh, long-term, uh, our hope is that each of the departments will have people within, uh, those departments who are as expert in outreach and engagement, uh, and that it becomes part and parcel of those jobs. Uh, so while we're changing this organizational behavior and um, culture, the co-ed staff is essentially acting as the, the trainers for all of our department staff. And then over time, um, the departments will ideally start to take on more and more of that work themselves so that it becomes, uh, frankly, an embedded behavior in our operations rather than a consultant behavior where we have a division that's providing that service. We're not there yet. So I think um, ultimately as we're looking at our staffing complement uh, and thinking about the work that they're doing, these types of positions that are directly um, uh, resident facing in the services they're providing, that expectation for engagement and outreach skills will be a, a necessary component of the job descriptions for them. Okay, um, and uh, if I may, just a quick follow up. Uh, so you'd also mentioned there would be kind of a variety of um, projects that that individual will be working on as well. So the, the second position here uh, for sustainability specialist, uh, in your note, uh, you had mentioned uh, working on encouraging energy saving investments, all the various programs out across the community, getting folks connected with those. Uh, is that just because that type of work is so different from the work that would be done by the other sustainability specialist that we need two different folks? Or could that be one of the random projects alongside yeah, Council. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Martin, I think it's just the amount of work, okay. right? And so uh, there's a significant opportunity to uh, enhance and expand our programs working with residents to do energy improvement projects on their homes. Uh, to some extent with commercial properties too, but uh, recognizing that um, residential properties are the, uh, you know, the biggest uh, component of our city, that's the place that we want to focus. And that work alone uh, is enough to uh, probably utilize the vast majority of the full-time um, duties of this one employee. So that's above and beyond the work that's already being done by our sustainability coordinator. Okay, thank you very yep. much. Any additional questions? Onward. Okay. So next, um I think Jamie was going to go, this is just some information, this uh, recent information we have is in regards to lodging, uh, mostly just lodging taxes and our revenue forecast. Yep. Uh, this is where we nerd out a little bit, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Um, <clears throat> so <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of abbreviations and acronyms on this, on this page. We have a team uh, in, in the city that's been working together uh, since literally the second week of the pandemic, uh, recognizing when, when things started to shut down that there was going to be a dramatic economic impact. Uh, and obviously, given the, the strength and the um, strong presence of the hospitality industry here, 
um, there was a, a significant financial impact to the city of Bloomington, uh, far beyond what most other cities experienced. Uh, we derive a significant amount of our revenues uh, from uh, sources other than property tax, and lodging and admissions are the are two of those biggest areas. We have 47 hotels in the city, um, the and three uh, percent of uh, uh, three percent of the seven percent lodging tax. Uh, every time one of those uh, rooms is sold, uh, comes to our general fund. In addition, there are admissions taxes. So there's a 3% admissions tax on every uh, entertainment activity within the city. So if you buy a ticket on Fly Over America or um, buy a wristband at uh, Nickelodeon Universe, there's a 3% uh, uh, use tax there. Uh, that all comes to the city of Bloomington. Uh, we saw a significant decline in 2020 and in 2021. Um, our team just had their monthly uh, uh, analysis meeting, and frankly, things are looking better uh, for 2023 uh, based on what we're seeing this year. Um, so we've already, as, as Kari said, when we uh, looked at some of the modifications we made to the um, base budget, uh, adjusted the forecast here by about $275,000 to the good. Um, so the lodging tax revenues are tracking much closer to 2019 this year um, than they were in the last couple years. June of 2022 was 89% of the June of 2019 lodging tax revenues. So we're almost all the, all the way back, not quite. Um, and based on the... Uh, updated STR metrics, uh, that's the Smith Travel um, report that we get. Uh, the modern analysis we use for budgeting uh, has increased, and so we're accounting for that. We continue to be more conservative than the hotel valuation services study that we use as a benchmark, um, but we're gonna keep watching it. So I think there's a decent chance uh, that three months from now we'll come back and tell you that our confidence level is allowing us to do a little bit of, a, of another bump upwards, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves um, because one thing we've learned is things change quickly, right? So, um, so we're we're cautiously optimistic is uh, what this report is about. Um, hotels are are reporting uh, the occupancy is starting to recover, um, but the the you know even more important than that is the average um, ADR is coming up. Uh, and so that's the that's the average amount that they charge for a room uh, on a daily basis. So, so uh, that's looking a little better than we, what we thought it was going to about three four months ago. Um, yeah. All right, and then this is just sort of the uh, graphic depiction of what's happened over the last few years. So you can see the lodging and admissions tax cratering in 2020. Uh, you see 2019 was really a high water mark. Uh, and 2022 is the gold. Uh, you can see it's tracking uh, just below 2019. And we're expecting that to uh, continue as well. And you can even see last year, um, 2021, uh, was starting to track really closely to 2019. Um, when we had a little bit of a step back uh, late in the year because of the emergence of the Omicron variant. All right, so people uh, inevitably ask um, uh, where our uh, tax levy policy is compared to other cities. Okay? Uh, I know that the council <laughs> is uh, concerned about what we're doing for our own city first and foremost and making sure it's the right policy for us. But we also exist in a large um, uh, metropolitan region and inevitably people are gonna look around. And frankly, this is a marketplace and people can um, vote with their feet essentially, right? And if they, they don't like what's happening here, they can go somewhere else. Um, so we, you know, we ask our colleagues where they're sitting and I will tell you flat out that uh, most of the cities are in a similar situation that we are. Um, you see a couple that uh, tend to be <clears throat> on, excuse me, uh, like Eden Prairie and uh, Blaine uh, and Maple Grove. Um, those, those cities are, are typically on the lower end when we look at this comparison. Um, they're also uh, younger cities than a lot of these other communities. 
Um, and even at uh, what they're talking about for their preliminary levies this year is a little higher than what they've had in previous years. Uh, and I, I also want to say, look, this is the staff uh, projection of what they were going to bring forward for a preliminary levy, right? So I don't want to get crosswise with any of my colleagues um, that I'm putting them out on a limb here. This is just information that we all share back and forth, right? So their councils may end up doing something um, dramatically different. Um, but you'll see um, uh, cities like Coon Rapids, Lakeville, Burnsville, um, Edina, all in roughly the same um, space that we are where we're, where we're starting right now. And uh, what's driving a lot of that will not surprise people. Um, we have uh, inflationary uh, increases uh, that affect our um, staff compensation and, and benefits. Uh, we have inflationary increases that affect the cost of goods. Uh, so what we, what we buy to support our operations. Uh, and then uh, many of these cities are making um, significant capital investments just the way Bloomington is right now too. Uh, a number of these cities are older, uh, like us, where they're, they're cities of a certain age where they're starting to reinvest as well. Um, and it, it's hard to do that without affecting the levy to some extent. So, you know, taking us back to the beginning of the presentation, we have $880,000 of new debt next year that's related to one new fire station, right? So that's, um, that's over 1% uh, of levy increase. It's about one and a quarter percent of levy increase just for the one fire station project. Um, so as we look around, we're seeing that uh, many cities are in the same situation we are uh, where they're trying to um, uh, take care of capital reinvestment in the community at the same time they're managing some inflationary pressures. Okay. Uh, we also looked at the history over the last uh, several years here to see whether uh, we are an outlier or where we stand compared to these other cities. And uh, what you see is the couple cities that I mentioned before, Maple Grove and Eden Prairie, uh, annually tend to be quite lower uh, than the other cities. Uh, Bloomington, you'll notice at 4.57, uh, right in the middle with Minnetonka and with Bookham Park, um, essentially the, the, the same uh, levy increase over those six years. And then you see that uh, Minneapolis and, and uh, Plymouth and Edina uh, all um, above where the city of Bloomington has been here over the last uh, six years. Um, and, and you didn't see Minneapolis on the last uh, uh, comparison. Uh, you know, they're looking at, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 11% for their preliminary. Uh, that was in, publicly reported. And then St. Paul announced they're in the neighborhood of 15%. Um, so a lot of cities looking at a lot of uh, pressures right now uh, to try and make sure that they can continue to deliver services that residents expect. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, uh, Mayor. So, um, you know, as I, I, as I look at, um, you know, at this, you know, this percentage change here, and I, let's say if I just take Bloomington and uh, Minnetonka, you know, we look at these uh, uh, levies that are, that are there. And if I take it from the perspective of the median household income uh, value, what a 4.57% impact for me in Bloomington be similar in the amount that I'd be charged in Minnetonka, for example. Yeah. Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, that's a really hard um, an analysis to make. That's why I'm asking it, because yep. I think it's important to ask that because, and I know the answer to that, <laughs> I mean, uh, because I think that's one of the, the, the difficulty in looking at, because I know before we used to have a chart, which I really liked. Yeah, I was looking in my packet because I, I, I thought that it was in here and I forgot that we didn't include it <laughs> because the, the chart is very good to include. Uh, because when we use those raw numbers, yep. I think that's a much better um, uh, example of the benefit you get in Bloomington right. than, than what you see here. And I think that some people, when they see this, this, this scares me when I see this because I think some folks then I mean, immediately go, what I did, I'm doing right now is go, okay, well, Maple Grove. I mean, you just you said it just a minute ago because, you know, you have different – you're not comparing apples and, and oranges. Right. 
um, you have a different uh, capacity. But I think we want to be real clear about that because I know that this is a public, you know, it, it's a public meeting, and when we're because we're studying it, we're looking at it at, for many years of experience. And I'm just kind of thinking about this. If this is the first time I saw this, I'm going to go. Well, obviously, the folks that are in Maple Grove are doing a much better job of managing uh, their budget. Yep. And so that's kind of the clarification I want you to kind of uh, help paint for me. So. Sure. And I'm just crystal clear for those folks who are just uh, looking at this for the first time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Uh, back in the early part of the presentation, um, Kari talked about uh, the um, process for um, valuation and distribution of value for property tax purposes. Minnesota has one of the most complex property tax classification systems and, and total systems in the country. Um, so it, it just isn't possible to look at a chart like this and say that there is um, similarity to these other communities when it comes to the monthly amount that somebody is paying for their city taxes because it has to do with the value of their home. It has to do with the overall tax base of the city in which they live. Uh, and, um, you know, the residential versus the commercial, there's just a lot of different components. So what we do is we try to uh, gather data about what the – uh, median value home is paying on a monthly basis or an annual basis. And we've shown that um, chart to the council every year. We don't have it in here, but we'll certainly make sure uh, that we provide it. And Bloomington has been either at or um, second to last at the bottom or second to last in the, that comparison chart for the last decade or more. It's actually just within the last three or four years that we got out of that vaunted bottom position. But if you look at what you see on this chart here, starting in 2016 and 2017 with those 5.75% increases, the city council made a, a, an intentional decision at that point in time um, to start uh, reinvesting in the community because there just had not been um, a significant amount of reinvestment, uh, starting with the parks. Uh, one of the one of the things that happened back in 2016 is that the charter was amended to allow the council to uh, issue what are called charter bonds, uh, and those were done um, to start um, uh, uh, spurring redevelopment of our parks. Right, and so we had a number of uh, charter bond issues for parks that uh, contributed to some of the higher levies than what we've seen before. Um, so it's it's hard to tell an individual city's story in a comparison chart like this, but the other chart shows where we are on a median value home basis. We're very low compared to the other cities. Um, I expect that we're going to start moving up in that comparison simply because we're a city of a certain age. We have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of facilities, uh, a lot of parks that um, we have planned reinvestment in over the next decade, and so uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna see uh, some of that reflected in in the levy itself. The other the other chart that we've shown often is one that looks at the total cost of government within a city, uh, and so it's not just the tax levy, but it's what people pay for um, other services, their utilities, their water utility, their solid waste, um, <clears throat> in and wastewater. Uh, you know, we, we account for cities that don't have softening in their water systems because we do, right? So a city that doesn't have softening, their residents have to go out and spend a fair amount of money on water softeners and salt every year. So we factor that in. And when we look at that total cost of government chart, again, we're, we're way lower than most of our other pure cities. And um, I don't think that that's going to change too terribly over the next few years. So I want to thank you for doing that. And just, uh, Mayor, you know, you talk about a paradigm shift. You know, we talk about the, the capacity and the capital expenses, that, you know, as the manager talked about, how we needed to do some of these reinvestments. And so I'm hoping that we're going to find uh, new instruments and new tools uh, to, to better compare ourselves, you know, to your point where you talk about that paradigm shift that we need to, we need to invest. And so this type of thing scares me because I think this, this – um, 
you know, I know this is, again, a study session for us, but as the public looks in over our shoulders and what we're trying to do, I think they may get the wrong impression when they see something like this. I think it's good for us. I like seeing something like this, but I'm also cognitive that we're, we are trying to make a paradigm shift and we're trying to move in different directions. And so, um, so I don't know what, what that means in terms of clarifying what that means, but that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out and trying to understand what you mean, Mayor, um, by that and what that looks like. No, understood, and I appreciate that, Council Member, because yes, you're right. This is what we're looking at. The, the vast majority of this is increases in in public safety and increases in our infrastructure investments. That, um, frankly, is overdue and, and needs to be done if we're going to continue to move forward as the community that we want to be. Um, you want to jump to the next slide? So when we start talking about where we want to be, uh, Council Member Lohman's question was a good one for setting this up, is where, where do we want to be at least for 2023 and how that sets us up for the future? Um, you know, right now in, in your packet is 11.58%, I think was the number, or somewhere in that range, 11.58. I don't know why I did that without my glasses on, so <laughs> could be any number, I suppose. Um, so what we're showing on this slide here is um, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what amount we'd have to solve for. You know, we got to solve for X if we're going to come in at a certain number uh, below what's been presented tonight. Uh, so, for example, if you want to be somewhere between um, 9 and 10 percent, uh, you know, try to get into single digits at least with the levy increase, uh, then we'd be looking at uh, modifying uh, the budget to the tune of $1 million to $1.7 million to accomplish that reduction. Um, and, you know, I, I have no doubt that we'll be able to do that. I think we'll have some, um, you know, some things that we'll have to uh, look closely at, and we may have some pretty uh, significant policy discussions with the council. Um, it, I'll... I'll uh, go on a little bit of a tangent here and, and maybe set you up for uh, what we ask you for in terms of direction. But, you know, earlier on the list you saw, Kari, including the reductions, $800,000 for um, sidewalk plows. Okay, so this is an example of some things that we may want to talk about. So there were four sidewalk, uh, new sidewalk plows that were requested by Public Works. And the rationale for uh, <clears throat> doing that was twofold. It was uh, related to customer service level expectation, and it was uh, related to impacts of the organization of our current snow plowing policy. Um, we we get a fair amount of uh, feedback from uh, customers that they want to see our sidewalk snow plowed uh, faster than they are. Right? We have a prioritization method for getting to streets and uh, critical areas and sidewalks. Um, we always do sidewalks in business areas and, um, you know, safe routes to school and ADA. Those are top priorities, but the rest of the sidewalks aren't always in those top priorities. Our sidewalk plow operators spend a, uh, an inordinate amount of time in the first 48 to 72 hours clearing sidewalks, and those machines are really brutal uh, on our operators. Um, we actually can identify costs to our operations for workers comp related to operations within those machines. So part of the um, uh, rationale of adding more machines was to do two things. It was to deliver on the service level expectation that we get the sidewalks cleared sooner and it would have our operators in the plows less time exposing them to less um, uh, poor working conditions uh, which leads to more work comp claims. Okay. So we cut that out of the budget. So there, I think that we should probably have a policy discussion about what we're going to do with sidewalk clearing going forward or what our, what our philosophy is about um, sidewalks in general. So that's just sort of teeing up how the budget decisions are going to tie to some of the policy decisions that we need to think about. So this last slide before we just get into the budget calendar is this is of course very preliminary but I just wanted to show you based on what we've got plugged in for our 2024 conceptual budget um, if we had the 11.58% property tax um, levy for 2023 and we rolled this forward to 2024 
this is kind of what debt service is looking like. If we added back the strategic priorities um, amount um, and also had those positions that Jamie went over in here, it's looking like around, you know, this would be a range, right? But very preliminary, like 7%. Um, so I'll just go through this really quickly. But what's highlighted here are um, dates um, for city council meetings and for budget engagement. So September 12th is the meeting where you would set the preliminary 2023 uh, tax levy and budget. And then um, September 17th is um, when I have another budget table, and that's at the farmer's market on Saturday. Um, then we've got the fire department open house on Saturday, October 15th. And uh, for more um, chance for me to get out and talk to people about the budget, get feedback. And then um, the October 17th city council meeting is one where we'll bring the utility fund budgets and have a discussion about rates as well as internal service funds and some of the special revenue funds like the communications fund that does receive property tax support. And then November 14th is the date that's set for the public hearing for the utility rates and we'll have those budgets then too. And then November 21st is when we will have a meeting similar to this one when we get um, start honing in on the final budget and tax levy for 2023. And then December 5th is what we have scheduled for the truth and taxation date um, where we set the final tax levy. So just wanted to keep those top of mind of where, where we're at, where we're going. So with that, we have our last slide, um, questions and discussion, but these are um, main things that we're looking from count for council from from council for tonight is where you're thinking or you know where you're comfortable for a range uh, for the preliminary tax levy and then areas that you'd like us to dig in deeper to and study um, and then also about community engagement if there's additional things you would like us to do or change or anything there that you'd like us to try well thank you thanks for the comprehensive look and understanding full well that this is the first look and the first blush as we, we kind of go through this and begin our conversation on all of this. Um, I'll jump to the, bullet, the second bullet and I think we've covered a lot of the possibilities already, areas to study over the next three months, the possibility of uh, buying down some of these costs with um, strategic priorities funds, uh, especially the one-time costs, certainly not anything with a, with a tail. We've had that discussion. We don't want anything with tails on there and to look for other areas where that would be possible. I think to hone in a little bit better where the, uh, the liquor and lodging tax revenues will be, and I think I would agree with you. I think it's, we are being conservative. Uh, I think the city estimates have been below the actuals for a number of months now, and I think we can count on uh, a higher uh, revenue source there, which I, I'm, I'm encouraged by that. And um, I think also to, to, to look for ways to reduce existing budgets. Uh, you know, where, where will the haircuts be taken elsewhere or can there be haircuts taken elsewhere to, to try and, again, to bring that number down, the overall number uh, within our, our final levy. And I, I think that should be our discussion over the next three months, how we, how we get to our final number with a, a, that and a variety of other things in mind. And I will say the community engagement, I really do appreciate the work you've done with that, Kari. I, I think it's uh, engaging, I think it's creative, I think it's Another example of our efforts to get out and about and to make this more, more understandable or as understandable as possible, uh, to get community feedback on some of the priorities that we've been talking about to just get a better idea of where, what folks are thinking and where their, where their heads are. Obviously, it's not, as I mentioned earlier, not scientific in any way, shape, or form, but I think it's a good conversation starter and a good conversation to have with people where they are as opposed to inviting them to come to us and I, I applaud you for that and for the work that you've done and everybody else so thank you for that thanks very much thanks councilmember martin and then councilmember uh coulter i uh, thank thank you mayor um just uh three kind of quick areas um uh yeah, just three three quick areas i, I think um i 
I understand again the the sustainability uh, positions that were put in there and, and kind of the scope of, of work, I guess. But coming back to Hennepin County coming to us and saying all of you cities need to have some kind of organics collection program in place. Go ahead, do it. Okay, so we want to do something that's successful and not symbolic. Sure. So we uh, do a lot of community outreach. We're doing a lot of advertising. I'm, I'm seeing it in all kinds of publications. Uh, and I understand why a, a position to support that work is necessary. But I, I'm kind of shocked we're not seeing more resources from the county coming forward to help partner with cities to make this program successful, uh, especially since they have very real concerns about how that material is getting disposed of now. So I think moving forward, um, I, I appreciate the, the work that our grant specialist is doing. Uh, but just if we, throughout this budget process, can keep an ear to the ground with the county, because I can't believe they would say, everybody needs to do this. Go ahead, put some symbolic program in place. We don't really care, because that's not getting the trash out of the incinerator one way or the other. So I, I got to imagine there's there's some juice there to squeeze. Uh, in, in more broadly speaking, and this is more um, just something I've, I've noticed uh, in a lot of the facets that I, I work in, uh, I'm glad we're looking at a position to connect folks with existing programs uh, at all levels for sustainability. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of those out there. But I'm noticing in the nonprofit sector, in the government sector, uh, some of the um, intra-city boards that I'm serving on, every organization I work with right now is hiring multiple people to serve as a coordinator to connect people with programs and services at other organizations. Uh, so I, I would be curious uh, if this is... I, I've got to imagine this hasn't been a complete failure to advertise programs on the part of every organization out, out there offering some kind of subsidized energy assistance, whatever that may be. Um, not to say that work isn't important, but I just I, I see a version of this popping up. I got seven possible positions in budgets right now in my head at all these organizations. So is there some kind of way to to consolidate that or to do some kind of pilot in that with a subset of, say, just city programs or whatever it may be? Um, uh, and then uh, just finally, it, it, and this is kind of longer term, um, again, with mandates coming from other organizations at the state level, obviously we're, we have to have body camera programs, we have to have all this public safety equipment, and as those costs continue to ex escalate, um, is, is that, uh, could we work with our partners at the state to look at some kind of funding support for that, however small it may be over the long term because that is a top-down mandate? Uh, and it's, it's not germane for this conversation, but is that something we look to install in a more serious way in our legislative priorities list? Uh, there's, there's a lot in the world that's not fair. This is just one of the many. But uh, I, I think we could definitely find some partnership opportunities. So just what's bouncing around in my head. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. And Councilmember Martin, I believe the term you're looking for is unfunded mandate. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... Um, just quick question. So the, the 24, 2024 projected levy, that's based on, obviously it's a, a working model, it's conceptual, but that's based on the assumption that we essentially we adopt the preliminary budget proposal as it's laid out. At the 11.5. Yeah. That's okay. the flow through to 2024. Um, so the sort of the first, because I have two questions about that, just to clarify. Um, I'm, I'm assuming this debt service number for 2024 that is hopefully significantly lower than what it would otherwise have been because we we sold those bonds earlier than we'd planned to. I'm seeing nods. So yes. yes. Yeah, we actually yeah. have very little increase in debt service plan for 2024 um, because the, the uh, anticipated um, park improvements uh, will, uh, will come in the subsequent year. Yep. Thank you. Um, and then the other question I had, and I'm obviously I'm not a fan of sort of kicking thing, kicking the can down the road, but I mean I look at you know 11.5, 11.6% .6 levy increase for next year, and 7.12% for the following year. You know, to me that that seems like a pretty significant difference there, and so I'm wondering what thought was given to for lack of a better term, kicking the can down the road a little bit and sort of evening that out a little bit. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Coulter, I think the uh, 
the most likely place that we would look to do that would just be the timeliness of transitioning the fire department. Um, that's where you know we see the the biggest increase. Um, you know, the rest of the impact is is largely spread out, and so it, you know all. The, I don't want to say kick the can down the road. I would just say it would it would delay and defer some of the transition. Thank you, and I and I, um, I I think that's just a question that I'm sure we're all going to sure. get from folks in the community is is why not just sort of even things out a bit. So yeah, and I would I would offer just as a talking point, um, you know, if if somebody says. I'm going to make a bad joke, Chief. Where's the fire? <laughs> right? Why, why, why do you got to do this right now? Um, you know, I, I think that some of those indicators about, uh, you know, the rolling light on, on equipment, uh, those are continuing to decline um, our recruitment. And, uh, you know, we, we know the age of our firefighters and the tenure of our firefighters. And we know relatively how long each of them is going to be a member of the department, um, simply because um, it's it's not easy, and they get to 20 years, and uh, you know we thank them for their 20 years of service, and most don't stay long beyond that. Um, so it's a math problem for us that is entirely predictable for us. Yeah, and I, I guess I would just add to that. It it seems to me, it it's sort of a pay now or pay later kind of it thing, is. but the costs don't end up yeah. changing dramatically as well. So um, just wanted to get a couple, just some clarification on that. Um, as far as sort of a, a preliminary levy number, um, you know, obviously I'm not a fan of sort of picking a, a number and well, let's get to that. Um, I think kind of based on what I've seen and the numbers put forward, I think probably that nine to 10% range um, would be a good place to start. Um, but that's just sort of a very nebulous thing at this point. Um, and then, let's see. And then areas to study over the next few months, I think the mayor kind of covered everything um, that I would have raised there. The only comment I would make on that, and, and this relates more broadly to the discussion that we had about um, funding things out of strategic priorities, is... I'm I'm always a little bit wary of sort of I don't want to call it a gimmick, but essentially moving things around that way and using funds for what seems to be sort of an unspoken agreement for for things that are not sort of what they're intended to be for. And you know, my sort of interpretation of the the strategic priorities fund has always been you know that it that it is sort of those those sort of council directed priorities those sort of things other than the sort of basic services of government that we provide um, and i'm not necessarily opposed to using them for some of the the things that we discussed earlier um, but i i think at the end of the day if those are thing if those things come you know are those sort of basic services um, i you know just as a matter of policy i think we need to be sort of more upfront about the cost of providing government services to our residents. So I would just be a little bit wary of it from that perspective. Um, but absolutely agree, you know, we have the balance there. We, we certainly can explore and should explore um, other options there. As far as additional community engagement, um, one thing that I have been thinking about is it is a, it's related to sort of perception within the community versus reality. And so I think it would be interesting, and this is going to be another one of my classic come up with an idea and have little to no solution in mind, um, but it would be interesting to have a conversation based on a sort of a before and after. You know, like for example, with the, the chips exercise. So, you know, go in blind, where do you think we should, you know, where should we prioritize? And then you know, give them something like a one a half sheet breakdown of this is the percentage of the general fund that goes to public safety and public works and all of that and see, you know, what, what folks' reaction to that is. What folks, do folks feel we're spending the right amount, not enough, whatever it is, um, and just kind of see sort of that perception versus reality. Because I feel like a lot of the contact 
that I get, particularly on the budget, is um, I, I would say there's just some, some confusion about sort of the reality of, of the situation. Um, and I, I think that was really the only, the only feedback I had there. Um, on the whole, I, I think, um, you know, to the, the points the city manager made, I, I think, you know, 60% of the general fund budget increase is public safety. And most of the rest of it is just, we got to pay the people we have now to do the things that we're expecting them to do now. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, that is what it is. Um, that's, you know, that's the cost of doing business. And then a lot of that is, the rest of it is debt service, again, on infrastructure, on basic things that, that the community expects. So um, I look forward to seeing how you match our our expectations and, and feedback with um, with what you are experiencing. Yeah, Mr. Thanks. Mayor, if I could, uh, Council Member Coulter, uh, I do want to just uh, comment about the Strategic Priorities Fund because... Um, uh, I, I recognize that we call it that, and for the most part, we have used it as that, but it hasn't been um, singularly about strategic investment. I mean, a, a number of years ago, we were using it to um, buy down some fire pension costs, right? And, um, you know, that that was a significant amount of money. We, we used it to uh, make a transition for a fire um, uh Fire relief, a fire pension fund to help manage some of the volatility. We're using it for the um, transition from the COVID economy, right, with uh, carrying a little bit of tax stabilization for the levy. So uh, you, you could argue that that's strategic, and I would say it is, so that you're thinking long-term about the impact of our tax levy on residents. Um, but it isn't uh, always just about projects that are advancing maybe the strategic goals of the city that are other things that work their way in there and and then the um, uh, the other comment uh, the point that you made right after that one uh, was really good and I wanted to mention something about that too oh the perception of, uh, and reality <laughs> um, so we're gonna we're gonna come to uh, uh, the council in the in the next uh, month or so we have our um, community survey results um, we also uh, uh, had a survey in the field specific to the Bloomington sales tax situation. And so we're, we're studying both of those right now. And frankly, we have some contraindications in those surveys, right? So this, this discussion about um, perception and reality, I think the bottom line is for most of your constituents, um, their perception is their reality, right? So I think part of what we have to do is figure out how we can effectively message, um, you know, things that are happening in the community and, and how that affects them or how they experience it. You know, it's been very helpful over the last couple of months uh, when Chief Hodges comes up here and is able to point to continuing trends uh, showing uh, uh, safety is improving and crimes are declining. Right, that's that's a reality. So how do we get out and tell the story so that it's uh, it's matching the perception? Because frankly, there's a broader perception that that uh, crime is is exploding. Um, so those are the types of conversation we certainly appreciate your input, and that's why this third bullet about community engagement is really helpful. Councilmember Nelson, thank you, Mayor. Um, just got a few here. Um, with regards to strategic priorities, um, I differentiate the amount we put into the budget versus the positive budget variance, which is just kind of a rollover of revenues that exceeded expenses. And so, I mean, I think if, in my mind, if we take that and utilize it to pay for um, items in this year, that, that doesn't create as, uh, as much of a structural imbalance because structurally we had that excess in the previous year um with regards to sustainability um a couple of the questions i had there w with those positions is would we be better off and more efficient with one person focusing on residential and doing energy and organics so if somebody had a question about energy they brought up organics with them if someone had a question about organics they brought up energy with them instead of having two people go try to talk to the same household would there be some some things there um 
you know, I'm still a little bit um, uh, trying to understand what the goals, the measurable results, how would we know if they were being successful, if we're making movement on those things. And then the last question I had is, is frankly, uh, to Councilmember Martin's point, that there's a lot of people promoting energy efficient programs, including Excel Energy, um, uh, the Center for Energy Environment, uh, organizations like that. Um, and maybe the county should be doing more on organics. Um, are those our highest priorities as a city in terms of sustainability? You know, we look at water, we look at, um, you know, uh, Minnesota for is fortunate to have a lot of water, but we, you know, we, we worry about our aquifer. We've talked about this prefer before, um, you know, we see droughts in other parts of the country and things like that. Is water something we should be working more on than energy and that, um, given where the other resources are going? You know, we obviously hear from a number of very passionate constituents about natural resources. Should we be doing more in that area, those higher priorities? So you know, when I look at those sustainability positions, those are kind of the questions I have. Is that the best bang for our buck? Is that the highest use of it? And is there a different way of, of combining them? Um, and then I'm just going to bring up my, my annual list of things like, <laughs> what about new revenues? <laughs> you know, what, why aren't we getting more, uh, you know, advertising, sponsorship, things like that? I'll, I'll still say that, you know. I've said it every year, and I've never yet been asked to donate to um, our Third of July event, uh, Summerfest. <laughs> so, you know, and yet I would, you know, and I've said this publicly a number of times, and no one's ever asked me for money. <laughs> you know, yeah. Just that, you, all I got to do is ask. I'm very generous. <laughs> so, um, you know, things like that. I think we have a ton of opportunities there. Um, we've talked about fees. I think we've made good progress on fees. Um, you know, I think a former council member uh, used to always talk about what about our stop doing list. I think, think they might be mayor now. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know is, it, is it time to take a look at that type of stuff? I mean, because this is a significant amount of levy. Um, see, my other rant will be uh, about golf. I, I, I'm still, I mean, we just shifted the budget from Highland over to Dewan, and now we have a loss at Dewan that we have to tax subsidize. Um, you know, I call three rivers and see if they want another golf course if you want my opinion because i'd love to make we had to maintain the golf course but they seem to be doing a great job at highland um let's see well the maintenance worker we've had deferred maintenance for a lot of years i understand where we went but i think one of the questions that i had when we had that conversation about the maintenance worker is can we quantify the financial impact of that i, I still haven't seen that we can quantify that and given that we've had you know, decades of um, underinvestment potentially in those or under maintenance of those properties. Does waiting another year make that big of an impact on it? And the reason I bring that all of that up is, I mean, obviously the number is significant at, you know, over 10 percent and we might whittle it down to, to nine or something like that. But I'm just very concerned that we are very potentially heading into a recession. And we have a lot of people in this community that, that are struggling currently and maybe struggling a lot more next year. And this is not only the levy going up, but then the residential property values having gone up is going to sort of exacerbate that problem for them. Not to mention, I mean, you know, if it isn't residents, it's businesses paying this. And, and you know, someone's got to pay these things. And these are all great things. I just, you know, what's our focus? What what are our priorities? I'm just really worried about it. I mean, the the economy, rising interest rates, inflation, um, uh, potential recession, and we're talking about this big of an increase. It's it's unsettling to me, to be honest with you. And 100% agree with supporting fire and police and so that's why i'm asking on these other things in other things maybe we've already approved should we be really look, looking at that um are those really things that we absolutely have to do we absolutely have to make sure there's firefighters on a truck when they roll we have to make sure the police are there to take care of our safety we have to make sure the water is safe the streets are plowed beyond that they're discretionary they're things that we should do and, and they're important. I don't disagree with that, but um, I guess 
that's my commentary on the preliminary levy range without any specifics. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lohman. Well, I guess I don't have a have a rant. I guess. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so I guess um, I, th I thought it was I think it was a very good. Uh, presentation, um, and I think that uh, what staff has has put together, along with the city manager and the and the staff directors, have done a nice job of of kind of getting us to where where we are here today. And I appreciate uh, the work that's been done uh, to get us to where we're at. Um, I think back to the chip exercise, um, and um, and I was a little. I thought maybe what you might say is that we design the different categories based on the strategic uh, plan that we kind of spent time doing. That's why I thought you might kind of respond with and say that. And so, because that's sort of as I as I as I look at this, uh, that's kind of the lens that I've been kind of kind of looking at this. You know, okay, we have a strategic um, plan. You know, 2022, 2027, and. So if I look at that and I try to compare in terms of, you know, kind of where we're going with relationship to that, my, my question for the, you know, city manager is, um, as you're, you know, as you're looking at this, and I have a, you know, I have an answer, <laughs> you know, uh, for that, but, you know, as you look at in terms of where we're trying to go with that strategic plan, that all those folks that gathered here, um, um, you know, many, many months ago at the end of, end of COVID, um, right in the middle of COVID, if you want to say, it, really, um, how do you see this addressing that that viewpoint, and how does this get us closer to that that vision? You know, we talked about you know in that vision in terms of making a you know a remarkable, um, uh, cultivating an enduring and remarkable community where people want to be. Um, uh, and I'll just I'll stop there because I've got some other things, but I want to just start there to kind of try to refocus the how how we look at this uh, at this budget as we're marching into next year. Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Loman, uh, work plan for the um, strategic plan will be September 12th, I think, is when it comes in front of the council. Can I would you say get that closer the, to the microphone, please. <clears throat> yep, thank you. Rock and roll in my past. Thank okay. you. Really hear you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, September 12th is when we'll bring you the work plan. The um, uh, the way that this is contributing towards it is, I think, exactly what you said, trying to zero in on those things that we do uh, that make community uh, want to be here and that help uh, move us into the future, right? So the, the investments that council is making in our park system master plan, um, you, you don't see it necessarily in this budget per se, but we have that work is in process right now. You're going to see it come forward in the uh, plans for the um, park investments that will be part of tr um, charter bonds that we issue in the future. Uh, you know, the frankly, the discussion about sustainability and uh, how we move forward there uh, is a, a big piece about where we're going in the future. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the comments from the council and trying to find uh, the best way to do that uh, and still accomplish the goals. Uh, so I, I, I can't really point to this budget and say, here's where it's matching up with the strategic plan because a lot of the work that we're doing um, at the department level is, is almost always focused on making the community better to some extent. We're just trying to be more intentional and thoughtful about it and what we're presenting here in the last year and then the next couple of years. Uh, what you will see when you when you uh, try to figure out what are we going to do as a work plan is, again, using that strategic priorities fund as the way to do one or two year projects that are going to start advancing it. And that's how my intent to, to use the strategic priorities fund and make those recommendations to you, it, moving things forward. So there is, uh, as was indicated before, um, like about an $800,000 amount that's a placeholder in there for projects or special activities or events or whatever it is that we think are going to um, help move the ball on those things. And, and the reason why I, I asked that question is because when you, you talked about the snowplow piece, for example, you know, um, you know, that that's an example of where I kind of say, OK, <laughs> you know, I, I look back at the strategic plan and, and how we're moving forward with that and how we talked about those types of things. And I'm just I'm just wondering, you know, you know, because we have existing programs that are that are that are kind of here today. And then we've got this other 
of kind of vision of what it may look like and that fear I've always had is that you're trying to, you know, you keep all of what you had before and then you move to a new thing. And so now you have a grand, you have two cities within one, you're trying to fund two cities. And at some point we have to kind of look and go, okay, well, what, you know, when does some of these things get wound down um, or, you know, or where, where are the tails? And, you know, we're already going to study that. And so um, th- those are just things I just want to, as we're looking at the bigger, bigger, uh, broader pieces of it. And, and as I look at this, you know, I look at our, our core values in terms of safety and security, our critical components of a resilient and healthy community. You know, I absolutely see the fire um, you know, component, the police uh, component. And then I also see uh, the health component because those things, uh, you know, kind of shake hands. You know, we've seen that over the last year. Um, uh, that's important. And then also, you know, the environment in which that we live in um, in order to cre- you know, continue to have a resilient uh, environment. And I, again, I leave it to staff to try to, to, to bring forward what uh, they believe is the best way to try to, to address the climate emergency that we put forward at the beginning of the year. Um, and if, if, if that, um, if, if that um, has been operationalized to the two positions and the other position that's in parks around natural resources, you know, so be it. I mean, I don't want to, I'm no expert in sustainability, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and I, I do appreciate, uh, you know, this council pushing back as I think we should to make sure that is indeed uh, the priorities in which that we should be addressing, um, you know, around um, uh, solid waste um, within our community. We know we just had the Burnsville um, piece basically uh, approved. And so uh, there are future uh, risks that are associated with that um, and, and things that, you know, should set priorities for us around solid waste in terms of how we move forward. And so I do appreciate staff uh, uh, allocating uh, folks to help out with organics piece. That's a big component of how we as a community uh, can step forward uh, to try to get to that goal that Hennepin County has set forward uh, by uh, 2030 of 75% uh, uh, reduction uh, when it comes to solid waste um, as an ongoing uh, basis. And so I, I just have a kind of a different uh, take on that. I, I um, While I think it would be great to have the county uh, contribute, um, I think they should. I agree with you on that. Um, uh, but I think that we need to uh, hit the ground running with that because we need to, you know, certainly we got 25%, but we need to move that, move that further. So I do appreciate that part. Um, You know, I'm going to leave it there, Mayor. I think that you've left out, you know, you've pretty much around the staffing pieces. I think you've, you've, uh, I don't know. you know, Thank I've you. got other things, but we can, I can talk to you about that later. Thank you for your comments. Others? Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. I will try not to be repetitive. Um, so I also just want to thank you for the great presentation. I, I really appreciate the level of detail. I appreciate all of the community engagement that you've done. I think about when I first started on council and, the level of community engagement that there used to be, or very little community engagement, <laughs> um, to now it's just really awesome to see um, the effort that you've put into it and then the number of people engaging with the budget um, discussions increase. And I do think part of our goal, obviously, is to get feedback, but it is also to get people to engage in these, com- like in general, understanding the city's budget and where their property tax dollars go and kind of just like this bigger picture, right? And so um, I just think you've done a really great job. And related to that, um, I really love, and I think that um, the city videos are um, very popular. And I think, I know last year we had a pretty robust city budget page and there's a couple of things up there for this year as well. Um, But I think that even after this conversation or as we get closer to that preliminary budget conversation or preliminary levy, um, discussion at a council meeting just to have a couple more video pieces on you know what it is that is being proposed why is our levy increasing and um, giving just more opportunities for people to engage in those ways uh, and then um, I do agree uh, that we should look at our strate- strategic priorities fund I'm supportive of that for just those one-time costs my impression is that that's a pretty small number in the grand scheme of uh, what we're talking about but um, I am supportive of that and also looking for other revenue um, opportunities 
And one of the things I did think about was the budget advisory committee. There were still a couple of things on their list uh, at that time to consider in terms of cuts. And so maybe, I mean, that was a couple years ago now, maybe that list would be um, outdated enough that we it wouldn't be as helpful, but it may be worth returning to. Um, and then I think one thing I would appreciate seeing is in that general fund, like I really love the um, – in the working model where you have the tax levy percent change, uh, I think it would be super helpful, maybe in a different slide though, to have the general fund change, but broke down by like X percent is for public safety. X percent is for ongoing staff costs. And then X percent is for sustainability positions. I mean, because I mean, we've talked about the sustainability positions, I agree, but at the same time, I feel like it's just like a drop in the water compared to everything that we've been talking about again. So, um, and obviously it's, it's critical work that we know we have to do. Uh, and then the last thing I will say, um, I would love to see us get to a single digit for our preliminary levy. I know it's gonna be very challenging, um, but I think that, you know, I agree with Council Member Nelson and his concerns about the economy and a potential recession. And I, mean, I think we all probably are and, um, but at the same time, we just have really necessary expenses that we have to fund, especially in public safety. And, you know, I think that um, as a council, we have been very conservative the last couple of years with our 2.75% levy increases, acknowledging that people were financially potentially struggling because of the pandemic. And, um, and I don't want to dismiss the fact that we may have some harder times um, ahead of us, but at the same time, how long will those harder times last, right? Like at this point, it kind of feels like there's always something that we're, we're dealing with. Um, and so uh, we can't continue to put things off and we have to deal with these issues. So um, so I guess I'm, I'm asking for a single digit while also acknowledging that it's gonna be very challenging. So thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, uh, I will defer to my more experienced colleagues as it relates to the levy range. I agree that it's, you know, a tough pill to swallow um, at any number uh, like that. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, I want to commend you for your community engagement as well. I know a lot of folks have said that. Um, I, I appreciate, you know, we talked a lot about early on about like getting out and asking people and meeting people where they're at. And you've obviously shown a model for how to do that. So kudos to you and the folks that have helped you along the way there, Kari, really great. Um, I, I guess what I would, <laughs> what, what I'm curious about is why people in the departments who are impacted by this decision aren't joining you on those conversations. I'm confused by, I mean, I know Brianna did, but like, um, I don't know. I, it's, it would seem to me that if I was um, our parks and recs folk or our public utilities folks or whatever, that I would want to be hearing this information firsthand. Uh, so maybe one of the things I would engage, in, encourage as part of community engagement is that you bring some of those people along with you or, or whatever so that they can hear it because, um, you know, if they're if they're too disconnected from the reality of the people's circumstances, then maybe they um, maybe they uh, don't understand the you know what the 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 actual um, issues we're we're grappling with when we sit up here and have these discussions, right? So um, hearing from them directly would be great. Um, regarding areas to study over the next three months, you know, to be honest with you, this and this is related to that, I think. I'm I'm looking at two two things that have we have seen as a as a council over the last couple of months, especially as it relates to like the assessment process that we've been working through. I, I'm looking at the contrast between. So so if you I, I apologize for putting Ms. Coleman on the spot here, but if you look at the HRA work right and how they they honed in on their priorities and what they said they wanted to do. And they came to us and I asked twice and they said, no, we don't need more people. What we're gonna do is refocus those people on the things that we said were important. I contrast that with 
one of the comments made here around, you know, public utilities, for example, or our public works department to say, you know, we have these, we have very similar programs and we're not seeing that innovation from that department. And, and again, we didn't maybe didn't ask for it. So I don't want to be, I'm not being, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to draw that contrast to say, is it, is it possible for us to, because what I'm missing in some of these cases is that we've, ta we've talked about what is strategically important to us. Um, whether we like it or not, folks, we, we called a climate emergency and we know that emissions and buildings are our two biggest things and so we probably should do some work on that front. So whether you like it or not, we said that we should probably follow it up with some clear action and some clear progress, right? Um, or we should rescind our climate emergency declaration and say we're not going to do it. I'm, I'm just saying that bluntly. But if, so, but, but how they do that and say, yep, we heard that the number one priority for public, uh, you know, public works on, on, in terms of consumer energy programming is these things, what are they not doing? Like, how can we refocus their, their, their resources to do those things, which we've said is a priority? And I'm wondering if we really do need more people to do that, or we just need them to stop doing other things and start doing only the things that we have agreed are priority. Um, so as you think about what to study over the next three months, looking at that HRA model, not because again, not putting on the spot, but the, 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 the ethos of that, I think would be really great to try to bring to the table in some of these cases. Um, because I think there's opportunity there. Um, I would say the same thing from our community outreach and engagement group. Like, as far as I'm concerned, we've defined what we think those folks should be working on in terms of saying that we've created strategic priorities here for those things. So where are they in terms of, of re-honing in? You know, do they have to do everything that they're doing and that, or can they stop doing some stuff to focus in on this stuff? That's kind of, I guess, what I would say is the one thing that I think is missing from this presentation. And that's not a, that's not a, that's not a, an, you know, that's not a critique. That's, that's more just like, I, I would love to see those kinds of shifts so that we can we can talk to to our constituents about where we're making the right investments based on lining all this stuff up. That's all. I don't. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Council, anything else? Anything to wrap this and put a bow on it, or? Do you have any final final comments, Jamie? I don't. I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the feedback. It's helpful, and um, I think we'll. I think we've got an idea of where we should be when we come back in September. Very good. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. This is uh, very helpful. I appreciate the. It was. It was very helpful. Thanks for the discussion, and look forward to the continued discussion over the next three months. Thank you. Thanks, Council. The only other item on our agenda is uh, update. I will say, um, as our two people wearing badges as they left the, uh, the, the council chambers quickly here, there were there was a report of shots fired over at the Shields in Eden Prairie at about 725, and both our Bloomington police and Bloomington EMTs and fire responded, and uh, apparently there was uh, one man found deceased from a, looks like a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound, but showing again the volatile nature of everything we're doing and, and the expectations of the people that, that serve us and, and the work that they do. So it's uh, just a, a, a kind of a footnote to everything we're doing here tonight and the discussions we're having here tonight. Council, is there anything else? Council Member Lohman? Um, well, you know, since we are, we, are, we are talking about the crime piece, I got one other thing. I, just, I, I wanted to thank you, Mayor, uh, for your work that you have done around crime, um, uh, coordinating and working with folks uh, uh, to try to, to, to continue to keep that uh, as a priority. So just want to, again, just uh, appreciate your willingness to look into that, take that uh, very soberly, uh, as we know that the climate has, has changed around that. So uh, thank you for that. Um, one um, item that had been brought up in the... Um, uh, in the one weekly is the uh, garbage recycling and organics rates. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, 
that folks read that in there. Um, I'm definitely interested uh, in that. I'm not sure if other folks have had a chance to to uh, uh, say their interest, but I want to make sure that you can see publicly I'm interested in that. I'm not sure if there's other council members that are interested in having that conversation. Thank you. And, and thanks for your words, council member. I'll pass all of the credit on to our Bloomington police and our police chief and everybody else who works. And, um, and, and the, actually the mayors in the Southwest Metro who have come together on a number of things as well on this one. So, Council Member D'Alessandro? Uh, as a follow-up to that, Mr. Mayor, um, do we have any update on whether or not we are bringing forward a consideration on the catalytic converter ordinance yes. or thing that we talked about a couple months ago? Mr. Sure. Mayor and Council Members, it is uh, scheduled for an upcoming uh, Council meeting. I believe that is September 12th or September 19th, one of those two dates. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Yep. There you go. Yep. Council Member Nelson? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to thank you for your testimony in Burnsville with regards to uh, Trash Mountain. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, it's my understanding, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that uh, Burnsville did approve that. I just was wondering, I think a lot of people are interested in that, if we can get an update and then if there's any updated information on the additional amount of waste that they're looking to put into the freeway dump uh which was honestly a complete shock to me mm -hmm. um and and very uh disturbing so yeah, Mr. but if we get an update well, I guess if we can get an, an update as to what we understand to be next steps there and what we could consider as next steps yeah mr we'll mayor and council members actually i uh, we may even have mpca staff here next week um, presenting at the meeting I got to check with our senior planner or city planner, Glenn Markegaard, who's been in contact with them. They've offered to come out and, and uh, present, and I can't think of a more timely <laughs> point uh, to do that. We actually had staff at the Rotary meeting today. I had to step out of the meeting. I know Council Member Lohman was there, um, so there are still steps in the process uh, moving forward with the permitting and I think it's good to get an update. So we'll we'll provide that additional information that you requested, Councilmember Nelson. Okay, Councilmember Nelson, mm -hmm. good time to do that. Councilmember D'Alessandro, second bite at the apple. This was, yes, I. Um, it's timely and relevant, I promise. Um, you, Councilmember Nelson's comment made me think about something. I, I know when I first had meetings with you, city manager, one of the questions that I asked on the, um, as it relates to the South Loop and the development that was being done there as to whether or not we could um, implement um, an incinerator there that would basically close the loop on heating and air can, like energy development and things like that there. And I remember at the time, Shane probably provided some commentary on that. But this seems, th th I'm just curious if the South Metro incinerator option as a is viable against this landfill concept. We know it doesn't necessarily step us down on the sustainability curve as much as we'd like it to be. Reduce is the one way that we get there more than anything, right? Um, but it is better than a landfill in terms of econo uh, econ both economic and ecological impact. And so is there has there been any discussion, maybe maybe you, Mr. Mayor, would know um, about that at, at the Southwest, you know, councils of, of mayors or whatever. It, it, I'm just kind of curious it just um, that we haven't pursued that knowing that it has been as successful as it has been in the North Metro area. And, and I would agree, council member. Actually, yes, it's not ideal to burn the garbage, but the HERC is significantly more efficient and more and a better option than landfilling without question. Uh, I have not heard a discussion uh, regarding the mayors, especially in Hennepin County, because our trash to this point goes to the HERC. Uh, and I haven't had the discussion of, with any of the mayors south of the river, where the, which are the primary contributors to the, to the Burnsville landfill. No discussion among them as to uh, options or possibilities. No discussion. I don't think the MPCA has even broached the subject, to be honest. But it's, um, it's certainly, it would be a, a more viable option, I would think, than simply creating the, the mountain. But worth, worth the discussion, I would think. And Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, uh, I think the information that Shane probably shared with you about the South Loop is that there was a study of uh, um, energy um, in like 2010 or 2011. 
and and different forms of energy generation and whether they were um, whether they were feasible or not. And at that time, it showed they were not. We have not updated that study since. Uh, you know, and that looked at things like wind and uh, it, other uh, is solar, right? And trying to figure out if if there are other ways that we could serve the energy needs out there. Um, I can certainly talk to some folks and see if if there would be anything. And I think the mayor through the regional council of mayors may be doing the same. We can we can do a little outreach and see if the time is right. Maybe. Uh, to look at other options. Very good. Mr. Verbrugge, anything? Yeah, a couple things, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, first of all, we had um, our reboot on the town halls last week. The mayor did an excellent job for an hour and a half, uh, about 20 minutes of uh, presentation, and then the remainder of the time answering some questions that were submitted either through Let's Talk or um, were provided um, by attendees that night that wrote them out in index cards. And our um, our celebrity uh, question drawer, Chief Seal, uh, sat next to the mayor and pulled them out of the glass bowl so there couldn't be any uh, question about whether we were trying to game the system or not with the questions, right? So every question that was submitted got in the bowl and then... Uh, they all made their way out, or most of them made their way out to the mayor. Um, so we'll do a couple things for the rest of the council. We'll provide you a copy of the questions that were asked, um, and then uh, we'll also share the presentation, and um, we'll start preparing for the town halls that we'll do in each of the respective districts. I know that uh, Mr. Billhart has reached out to the council district representatives uh, to get your town halls on the calendar. So we'll try to get those lined up and um, do so so that we can start marketing them through communications uh, and even try to get them in the briefing if we've got a couple of months notice. So I, I saw September 26 potentially for council member Martin uh, to be the next one up. So um, I think we're taking advantage of a Monday where you all don't work to uh, still do a little bit of constituent engagement. Um, I also wanted to follow up Council Member Nelson. Um, there'll be uh, an opportunity for you to be generous in your water bill coming up as we send out information about Summerfet, uh, inviting people to donate. So please uh, make sure that you open your mail in a timely fashion in the next couple of months. Uh, Mine's on auto pay. And... <laughs> <laughs> so if you could give me a separate reminder, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, uh, let's see. I'm looking at the mayor. Oh, I know. I'm looking at the city attorney. So uh, just for the uh, sake of the public, uh, council is aware that uh, we were served with a lawsuit related to the council's action. Uh declining to put a uh, ballot question on the uh, November election for uh, an amendment to the charter uh, asking residents, asking citizens to vote on uh, ranked choice voting and repealing it. Uh, so uh, the, the lawsuit asked for the court to um, place it on the ballot uh, and also suggest to the court that um, they should sever the the um, item that is especially constitutionally problematic, and that's the two-third majority um, element of the petition uh, for any future uh, referendum regarding ranked choice voting. Uh, so the city submitted its response today. There's an emergency hearing uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, depending on the outcome of that, we may need to st uh, schedule a special emergency meeting of the council um, that would happen probably late on Friday afternoon, uh, depending on what comes out of the court. Is there anything more you want to say about that, City Attorney? Okay. So, appreciate the work that our legal team did, by the way. Uh, they were drafting all weekend. And yeah. so, uh, Melissa and uh, Peter and... Uh, uh, I don't know if Maureen was involved in that too, but then our outside counsel as well. Um, all of them uh, put in a significant amount of work and really appreciate their efforts. So. Thank you for that. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember D'Alessandro, third you. time at the Apple. I know. Well, I didn't have, apple. these are things that are coming up as a result of the commentary, so I, I couldn't have predicted them in advance. Um, you're... Uh, City managers uh, 
re reminder regarding the town halls um, made me think of the fact that the current uh, town hall um, dates that Mr. Brillhart gave me um, potentially conflict with the visit from the BIE. And so I don't know anything about whether they're coming or not. And I was hoping that maybe somebody could give us an update so that we can be more specific as we're, you know, two months out here on what those dates might be so we can work around them if we need to, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Mayor and council members, uh, council member D'Alessandro, uh, still the first or second week of October is uh, the expected visit. And I know that they are planning to spend two days in Minnesota and two days in Washington, D.C. Um, so we're hoping to have that um, really specified here uh, soon so that we can um, start to do our planning. Uh, so we'll, we'll share more when we have that information. Yep. Councilmember Nelson? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, it's too bad that they're not coming in January. It would have been <laughs> fantastic. It just, uh, uh, second, I was just wondering if I could get a copy of what we submitted for that legal. I assume that would be uh, something possible. Just interested in reading it for you know, like nighttime reading. <laughs> we can send that out tomorrow. Anything else? Uh, I will say with the uh, town halls, I think we had just short of 50 people. I think we had like 47 or 49 people, which wasn't bad for a Wednesday night considering we were competing with the, the market and music up here. And uh, good questions and good response. It was actually, it, it was fun to do. It really was. So, so you got something to look forward to, Council Member Martin. No further, nothing further with the council. Look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much for the discussion tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Well done.